Good afternoon, everyone. We get started. We have 14 bills. They are, uh, we'll go in the order that it's out there on the uh, screen. And we'll get started with uh, 514, Senator Lamb. And could I have uh, Mr. Cassell come up as part of the sponsor panel? Great. All right, well, good afternoon, uh, Budget and Tax Committee, Chair Gazzoni uh, and members, happy to be here to um, present at Senate Bill 773. As you know, for the record, Senator Clarence Lamb, District 12. Um, this bill is a bill to help streamline the certification process for minority business enterprises who are certified by the state. Over the interim, I had conversations with minority business owners about the number of steps that they have to go through in order to be certified to be minority business enterprises in each county and across the state. Although each county has very similar requirements, there's still a separate application process that has to be completed for each uh, county an MBE wants to do business with. This bill seeks to streamline this process by allowing businesses to use state MBE certification for local MBE programs. Currently, the state MBE certification program is run through MDOT. Businesses go through a several month process to document that they meet the state requirement of being a minority owned business. The state MBE certification program is required to promote the certification of businesses that hold a county certification. So this, so this bill is creating a reciprocal recognition for further streamlining the process, regardless of where a business first seeks their certification. Under this bill, counties would still be able to set their own MBE contracting goals or certify businesses themselves. This is just to help speed up the process and reduce the number of hoops that MBEs have to go through, particularly if they already have state certification, to not have to jump through an additional hoop for county certification as well. I reached out to MACO, and they are comfortable with this bill, um, and that's the bill. It's pretty straightforward. So I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague here on the panel and then take any questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, um, Vice Chairman, and uh, members of the committee. My name is Chris Costello. I'm rep here representing the Howard County Chamber. Uh, the Chamber uh, supports the bill. Uh, we think that uh, and agree with uh, Senator Lamb that uh, this can uh, obviously help uh, the minority businesses in uh, Howard County uh, who uh, if they have the certification from MDOT, uh, which is a rigorous certification, uh, it certainly will help them if they are hope to do business in multiple counties. Uh, they certainly can simply take the, the certification for Howard County if they only intend to do business in Howard County. Uh, that's not a problem. But uh, if they already have the certification for the state that shouldn't they shouldn't have to be uh, worry about uh, going through additional certifications in other in Howard County or any other county. So this bill makes a lot of sense, uh, and we actually thought it had already been done. So um, with your help, we'd like to ask for a favorable vote. Thank you. Question, uh, Senator Elbrus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, thank you for this bill. It makes a tremendous amount of sense. My only question is, would you, for those of us who are fortunate enough to represent municipalities, would you consider opening this up to municipalities as well? Certainly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Um, I had two other people. Are they not part of your panel? or Are, are there others here in favor? Okay, evidently that was it. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, move on to your next bill, 773. Bring up everybody you sure. like. So we have uh, uh, Greg Cook, Joshua Adler from Office of Legislative Audits, as well as Lori Doyle from Community Behavioral Health Association. Okay. 
Um, so good afternoon, uh, Chair Gazzoni, members of the Budget and Tax Committee. Pleased to be here to be able to present Senate Bill 773 for the record, Clarence Land Center in District 12. Um, we have members of OLA, uh, Greg um, Hook, as well as his colleague Joshua Adler, who are here um, to, per, to answer any questions and also to be able to speak about some of the audits that have taken place. OLA does not take official positions, so just want to be clear about that um, from the get-go. So um, this is a, a good government bill. This is a bill to really help improve accountability and transparency with our state contracts and uh, vendors that we employ here, of which there are many. Um, this bill concerns liquidated damages, and liquidated damages, um, for those who may not be familiar, pertain to um, services that are provided as part of contracts that are um, solicited by the state. The contracts, um, generally developed by the contracting department or the state procurement office, contain descriptions of services to be provided, as well as liquidated damages clauses. These liquidated damages um, and their clauses clearly outline the financial responsibility that the vendor is responsible for should they not meet a contractual obligation or agreement. The agreed upon damages are important because it can often be difficult to calculate the cost of lack of a performance in um, a service contract that the state enters into. Currently, the decision to seek those damages is at the discretion of the leadership of that individual department. This first came to our office's attention during a joint audit and evaluation committee meeting last year. An audit presented at that meeting specifically investigated the Maryland Department of Health's handling of a contract with Optum to administer Medicaid benefits to state behavioral health providers. Um, and I think the Optum case is instructive to be able to illustrate the concerns that the state has when it comes to liquidated damages policies. The Department of Health's Behavioral Health Administration provides mental health and substance use disorder services to the residents of Maryland, and these are funded through a combination of grants and contracts to pay for behavioral health providers. Optum was contracted to provide claim services for the department. Um, their contract does include liquidated damages in it, um, and so want to be clear that even their contract actually did include a liquidated damages clause. However, upon the start of Optum's contract in 2020, their claim system was essentially unusable, was um, broken in any ways, and Ms. Doyle, representing the Community Behavioral Health Association, um, will be able to um, speak to more of that firsthand as to the direct impacts that we saw on our behavioral health providers. Due to this systemic dysfunction, Optum paid providers estimated payments for their services, and by the end of 2021, there were almost 300,000 unresolved federally denied claims that totaled approximately $106 million that have been mistakenly paid out. Or there were, in addition to, there were 388 claim, 388,000 claims totaling $17 million that were approved for a different amount than what was determined appropriate by the federal government. So in total, there were over $120 million of claims that were either um, mistakenly paid out or could not be properly claimed. Additionally, the state lost $28.2 million of anticipated federal funding that was contingent on having working claims services, of which when the system first rolled out, that was created by Optum, it did not was not able to do that. All in all, Optum's actions uh, cost Maryland taxpayers over $156 million based on audit findings by our own Office of Legislative Audits. Per the assessment of the auditors, the state could have sought liquidated damages to the tune of about $20 million for the violation of the contract. When questioned why the Department of Health did not seek the damages, the de department responded that they did not want to damage the relationship with the vendor or that would result in additional litigation and other concerns. Um, our committee, the Joint Committee, Joint Audits and Evaluation Committee was frankly astonished that liquidated damages were not sought in this instance. Um, and we are concerned that similar violations of contracts that may have occurred without seeking damages. This is a dangerous precedent as the state contracts out for over $23 billion of our $66 billion state budget. Although there are likely scenarios where pursuing liquidated damages wouldn't make sense, the General Assembly requires contracts to include liquidated damages as appropriate and waiving these damages after significant contract violations incentivizes future vendors to take advantage of the state. 
and this is not the only example. There are other instances as well. Um, just to point out a few, in 2017, the Office of Personnel Services and Budget, or sorry, Personnel Services and Benefits contracted out $2.2 million to a vendor to conduct audits of various other contractors to ensure compliance. Not only did a majority of these audits not actually occur, the vendor's contract did not have liquidated damages built into the contract. The office had no way to recuperate $2.2 million that was paid out to this vendor. Additionally, since the vendor did not complete the audits, the office could not hold many of the other contracts accountable for their respective liquidated damages. So kind of a spiraling domino effect there. In 2017 as well, the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services contracted with a medical services vendor for correctional facilities. The contract did contain liquidated damages as part of their contract clause, but the department had no meaningful way of assessing if that clause was violated. They were not collecting reliable data to be able to seek liquidated damages on 38 of 39 metrics in the contract itself. In 2017 as well, the Department of Information Technology, DOIT, contracted with a vendor to build a cell tower. The vendor contract did have liquidated damages. However, the project was not completed on time and the department could not seek $47,000 of liquidated damages as they gave informal permission to the vendor to extend the time to completion. Many other state departments, including the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Health, Department of Human Services, as well as local municipalities, such as county school systems, have either been unable or unwilling to assess liquidated damages in multiple contracts. Under this bill, we would implement a variety of policies to keep contracts accountable and ensure that we are being responsible with taxpayer dollars. The provisions are as follows. First, we would require the Board of Public Works to draft guidance on inclusion and use of liquidated damages. This would include indications for liquidated damages, how to respond to violations, and possible payment structures. Uh, secondly, this would require the state to seek liquidated damages if the contract is violated. If the respective department decides not to seek damages, they must communicate with the Board of Public Works the specific reasons why they will not seek the liquidated damages. The reason for this is because BPW is further removed from actual contract negotiations and has the ability to more to be more impartial on whether to pursue damages or not. Additionally, two of the three members of BPW are directly elected um, and a third elected by us. And so this ensures more accountability back to taxpayers um, by having elected uh, individuals be able to make the ultimate decisions on this rather than just leaving the decision up to a departmental secretary whether or not to pursue tens of millions of dollars in liquidated damages. Third, this bill would require that the Board of Public Works be notified if the contract is modified in a way that is related to the liquidated damages, as well as include an attestation that deliverables are being completed on time and that there are no major performance concerns. And lastly, this bill requires that each department create an annual report listing contracts and their respective liquidated damages, as well as if the department is seeking those damages. Um, a few final things to note here. Um, in the fiscal note, it cites the fact um, that this could delay some potential contracts from moving forward. I think um, many of us and, and maybe some of the auditors might agree as well that um, if the contracts are being procured properly as part of the standard process, it really should not extend or delay the procurement process by any meaningful amount because this is oftentimes already required as part of DGS's process. And so we believe that this will not necessarily lead to unnecessary delay. Um, the Another point to point out is that um, the Maryland Department of Health still has this as an outstanding finding in their last audit. They still contend that there is no need, even in their last communication to the Office of Legislative Audits, that there is no need to have a policy on when to pursue liquidated damages or not. Um, let our legislative auditors disagree, and so they've actually, in their final correspondence, cited that back to the Joint Audits and Evaluation Committee as something that we may or should look into a little bit further. Since um, this letter was recent, we have not actually had an opportunity as a joint committee to convene, and certainly we'll be looking to um, uh, investigate that a little bit further. Um, and finally, when it comes to particularly this MDH case, if we don't pursue this, it really undercuts our procurement process, that it lets vendors and contractors off the hook and more likely to be to underbid in the future potentially or to um, underproduce um, without penalty and recognizing that um, that may not come back to bite them at the end if they were to actually obtain the contract. 
Um, there's also a letter from um, the Department of General Services that's uh, been submitted as written. Um, and I think when in looking at DGS's letter that they misunderstand some components of this bill that we just outlined here, this bill does not take away the ability of agencies to develop their own written liquidated policies, liquidated damages policies. It just requires them to have to develop a liquidated damage policy themselves for their department and that that policy be consistent with BPW's model policy. Currently, multiple departments do not have written policies on liquidated damages, which makes it harder for departments to fairly implement liquidated damages when needed. Mm -hmm. Additionally, I'm open to figuring out a different or better process if one comes forward to implement the BPW approval process in this bill. But I do think it's important that decisions about whether or not to pursue liquidated damages be transparent and not simply be decided upon by some folks um, within various departments. I've also the review, reviewed the letters from con the construction industry expressing concern about this bill, some of whom maybe um, have submitted written testimony or testifying after this, that this bill is duplicative to current requirements. I think it's important to note the DGS requirements to include liquidated damages in construction contracts is actually currently stronger than the requirements for other types of contracts. So it is possible that there may be less issues when it comes to liquidated damages in construction related contracts with the state, but it's also important to note that um, this bill will help make sure that we take steps to ensure the tax dollars are being adequately protected, regardless of the type of contract, especially those outside of construction, which still are significant and can be meaningful. And, um, uh, you know, OLA has found issues related to liquid damages, liquidated damages in all types of service contracts, not just um, construction, not just ones related to MDH, but all across the board in some of those examples that we presented earlier. So in closing, this is really a good government and transparent, um, good government bill to help improve transpar transparency and accountability amongst our uh, state departments and agencies, really to help elevate um, that level of accountability for us as um, uh, stewards of good tax dollars uh, expenditures, and I uh, hope that you'll consider this positively and happy to turn it over to other members of the panel for their testimony and take any questions at the end. Thank you. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Gregory Hook, and I am the Legislative Auditor. Although the Office of Legislative Audits takes no position on legislation, Today, I'm accompanied by Josh Adler, one of my assistant audit directors, to provide some audit perspective on the issue of liquidated damages. As noted in Senator Lamb's presentation, OLA has historically reported audit findings of state agencies failing to pursue liquidated damages for unsatisfactory contractor performance. In the past, OLA had recommended that the applicable agency simply assess and collect the permissible liquidated damages. The October 2022 audit report on the MDH Behavioral Health Administration marked a change in OLA's past approach to liquidated damages. Specifically, finding eight was that the Maryland Department of Health had not assessed up to $20.5 million in damages and had not developed a formal policy on assessing liquidated damages. That formal policy element is the aspect of the finding which documents the evolution of OLA's approach to this issue. Basically, it represents OLA's acknowledgement that there may be compelling reasons why it might not be in the state's best interest to pursue liquidated damages, and because of that, places the onus on the agency to justify and document the rationale. Accordingly, OLA recommended that the development of such a policy include criteria for conditions warranting liquidated damages and the determination of the dollar amount to be assessed. Inherent in this recommendation was establishing a formal accountability for the decision-making process in other words, how were decisions reached and who signed off on the decision? As Senator Lamb mentioned, the department continues to disagree with what we believe is a reasonable and practical recommendation, and I have in fact referred the matter in accordance with state law to the Joint Audit and Evaluation Committee for future consideration. JAC meeting attendees will be familiar with one delegate's frequent question about accountability of the specific agency employee responsible for an egregious finding. OLA always defers an answer to the agency, which in turn usually provides some nondescript or evasive response. This revised OLA approach is an attempt to introduce the concepts of accountability mm -hmm. and transparency into the decision not to pursue liquidated damages. Thank you for your indulgence. And with that, I'll turn it over to Josh Adler to provide a brief overview of the related Behavioral Health Administration audit report finding. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Adler. I'm an assistant director with the Office of Legislative Audits. I'm here to provide some background information regarding liquidated damages, which is the subject of SB 773. 
Liquidate, liquidated damages are used by parties of a contract with actual damages, though real. When when the when it's difficult to determine the how much the damages were. As Greg noted, the topic of liquidated damages and not having a formal policy for assessing them came up in our recent audit of the Department of Health. In that report, we noted that the contract between the Department of Health and its administrative service organization allowed MDH to assess liquidated damages totaling $20.5 million for the administrative service organization's failure to provide MDH with a functional system and for not complying with specific contractual requirements. Department of Health didn't assess these liquidated damages, nor did it have a policy on the assessment of liquidated damages. The Department of Health advised that it didn't impose liquidated damages, as, as Senator Lance said, because it was concerned that such actions would discourage the administrative service organization from resolving noted defects and may result in lit litigation. In layman's terms, the Department of Health's position was that the administrative service organization was too big to fail. And by charging, the, by charging liquidated damages, was, from the department's perspective, it was likely the administrative service organization would, would have failed. As noted in our auto report, in our opinion, the Department of Health's position is contrary to the intent of state law that requires a provision for liquidated damages as appropriate in procurement contracts, which implies that damages are subject to assessment. Thank you for your interest and in this very important matter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Lori Doyle on behalf of the Community Behavioral Health Association of Maryland. We represent 110 organizations that provide community mental health and substance use disorder treatment and support services. Our experience with Optum is exhibit A as to why we need this bill. Optum was hired as the administrative services organization to manage the public behavioral health system. Their main duties were to authorize services and play, uh, pay provider claims. Their system went live on January 1 of 2020 and immediately failed. The, heart, the department had to make advance or estimated payments to providers to keep us afloat. And that went on from January 1 of 2020 through early August of 2020. And of course, in the meantime, the pandemic hit. So providers are now in the process of paying back what Optum says they owe, even though Optum cannot provide the backup needed to ensure that the money is actually owed. And there are millions of dollars in disputed claims for services actually rendered during that time and the height of the pandemic. Providers have no real recourse. They must pay back the money or be turned over to central collections. Uh, Optum's dysfunction also resulted in data breaches and inability to comply with HIPAA electronic submission requirements. It would really be hard to overstate the damage Optum has wreaked on providers. At a time of unprecedented behavioral health demand, providers are paying back money they don't owe and diverting time and resources away from clinical care to chasing authorizations and payment for services. In the meantime, Optum has acted with impunity, even though the Office of Legislative Audits recommended that the department levy up to $20.5 million in liquidated damages against Optum. This should never happen again. We urge support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the panel? Looks like you covered it. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Cool. Yep. Looking at the other testimony, first of all, thank you for the bill and your testimony. Um, the the construction industry that is already covered, I mean, would you be adverse to either carving them out or, I mean, I just don't, it seems like they are already required to have those provisions. And do you think that they should be consistent with what you're trying to do here elsewhere or is what they're doing now sufficient? Uh, this so, is yes. Um, it's a good question. I think um, what they will contend is that they are already following many of the provisions. And, and I think the consistency across the board, whether it's construction or other types of services being rendered, I think is important. And, you know, what I point out then is if they are already um, coming up with policies for liquidated damages that are consistent with what's being proposed here, then they really shouldn't have anything to fear from this legislation, that this is already in alignment with much of what they're doing. But I think it is important as a state for us to have a uniform policy across the board for services that are being procured by the state, including construction services as well. And that's why I think, you know, I'll defer to the to the will of the committee, but I think it's important to, to try to have a uniform policy to the extent that we can. I have no idea, and I don't know whether you've looked at what their requirements are, but are they 
Uh, the requirements, yeah. I think, are actually stricter than what we have here because they are, there's some additional requirements that DGS puts in place on construction. And that's why, again, to, to my earlier point, I think if they're complying with what DGS requires of them, they're already meeting the requirements of this of this provision. Right. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I have somebody virtually. Um, Daniel Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Bailey. Uh, I'm an architect and current director of AIA Maryland. I come before you today to express AIA Maryland's strong concern for the inclusion of liquidated damage provisions in procurement contracts for architectural and engineering services specifically. We understand that all professional services, including our own, rendered on behalf of the state must be accountable to the applicable standards of care as defined under contract. Uh, as Senator Lamb had just indicated, liquidated damages are important and have worked successfully within construction services. Architects often serve as the state's eyes and ears during construction to ensure that the contractor meets its contractual and fiduciary uh, and schedule obligations. While liquidated damages may be used in construction services to ensure schedule compliance, it does not lend itself to professional design services. It is extremely difficult to tie design services to strict schedules as we do not provide a tangible product nor a physical task. Design is a collaborative effort contingent on the participation of client, regulatory stakeholders, and other variables not under our control. Liquidated damages are not covered by professional liability insurance, as is required under state law. Uh, it is deemed a penalty or a fine and outside a professional standard of care. State AE agreements uh, requires specific professional liability coverage. These agreements already include very strict provisions for the performance of AE services that have been tested and successful. The inclusion of liquidated damages would place an unrealistic and undue burden upon architects and engineers and could deter many firms from the pursuit of state AE service contracts. That burden especially falls upon small business enterprises which make up roughly 80% of Maryland's architectural firms. AIA uh, respectfully asks the committee to reconsider the inclusion of professional architectural and engineering design services within SB 773. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Questions for the virtual witness? Thank you very much, sir. That concludes the hearing on that bill. Moving on to 751. Senator Folden, bring up your uh, folks, whoever you got. Well, that's a real tight. Yeah. Like each other. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Mr. Chairman, welcome back. Glad you're feeling better. Thanks. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, for the record, Senator William Folden, Frederick County District 4, here to testify on SB 751, the property tax credit for disabled or fallen law enforcement officer and rescue worker alterations. Um, in 2008, we passed legislation, which was enabling legislation to allow counties to give officers who were injured in the line of duty and retired because of those injuries to get a tax break on their county taxes. Again, this was enabling legislation. Not every county did this, but some did pass local legislation to pass along this break. What we forgot to do was two things. First, we did not include our provision for the spouses of the injured officers to get this tax, tax break passed along to them when their law enforcement or um, emergency worker spouse would pass away. The provision in the original legislation says that this break only goes to the spouses when the officer dies as a result of his or her injury. This corrects that language and says that the spouse gets the tax break if the spouse passes away from any illness. <clears throat> the other piece allows for the increases in the amount of tax break. The original bill provided that the break was always to stay at the original amount given at the time of retirement. As we know, over the years, our property taxes have constantly increased, 
and this bill allows for any increase in the future. Again, this bill is a simple fix to original legislation that was passed unanimously. And remember, it's only enabling legislation we're asking for today that there should not be any loss to any state income. It's also important to remember that the thing that we don't want to do is when we have a disabled you know, emergency responder is to have them pass away and then lose the, this break that's been passed along to them and now have a single member household responsible for more because uh, monetary taxes because their loved one passed away and less of an opportunity to stay in their house. And this would affect them being able to stay in that house. And that's an important component here that was uh, missed on the first bill. And I'm asking for everyone's consideration in that. I ask for your favorable report on SB 751. And with that, I'll turn it over to my panel. Thank you. Um, my name is John Cluster and good to see a lot of old friends here. I don't mean old in the term old, but uh, uh, a lot of you I served with in the house. Um, I worked on this legislation back in 2008 and it was an oversight. Um, we're past for 15 years and now some of these officers are passing away. Not only did the spouse lose half of her income with the, uh, the public safety <laughs> person dying, but now they're getting hit with a tax bill that they haven't had for 15 years. Uh, as Senator Fulton said, there's only about a, um, a dozen counties that have done this. And I urge you, if you're from a county that didn't, please go back and ask your county council to pass it. Uh, it's an important piece of legislation. It wasn't until I, I heard from a couple of the spouses that I went to our county council in Baltimore County uh, and asked them if they would uh, include the spouses into it. And they told me that I couldn't do that. I had to come here first get, because it was enabling legislation get the um, Maryland legislature to change the bill, change the wording in the bill, and then we could go back and change that. That came from the attorneys. I, attorneys are much smarter than I am, I'm sure, and uh, they told me this is what I had to do. So I did. Uh, I, I reached out to Senator Folden. He, in turn, uh, put the bill in for me. We cross-filed it in the House, and we testified now on both sides. So it's just important, as Senator Fulton said, you know, as a as a law enforcement officer, and I was a law enforcement officer for many, many, many years, um, you're a family unit. Um, I may have been shot at three times, but in reality, my, when I went home, my wife felt just as much of, of my stress that that I had. Uh, when I saw a horrible incident where, where a child died, I went home and my wife saw the, the same thing through my eyes. So we are a family unit. And it's just not fair that if I passed away first, that she would lose this benefit along with losing half the income that I bring into the household. So I just ask you to pass it. It is in enabling legislation. It's not going to cost the counties any more than what they're already paying. Uh, I know Maryland Make Mako came through and said it could be uh, added income, but they're already paying it. So it wouldn't be any more income than they're already putting out now. So I just urge a, a favorable report and any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Frank Boston III. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland State Fraternal Order of Police, and uh, we wholeheartedly uh, support this bill. On behalf of the over 21,000 members, uh, this is a great bill, and I, it's already been articulated. I want to thank uh, Senator Folden for putting it in, the former delegate cluster for uh, catching the uh, loophole. Just want to reiterate that it is just enabling legislation and it's still up to the counties to do it. So on, on behalf of the FOP, we support the bill. Thank you. Questions for the panel, Senator Elfworth. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator, and, and to the panelists for being here. Appreciate the bill. I have a similar one. We, we deal with these all the time. Just reading Mako's testimony, their issue is that uh, it's, it's the current text credit is enabled, you adding to it would, their concern is that would automatically expand this in the jurisdictions that have enabled it already. So I think they're asking for what we call kind of like enabling, enabling here. So just to be clear that this wouldn't automatically, do you, you intend it for, to automatically go into effect for the counties that have already utilized it? Or are you saying that they have the ability to do so if their local jurisdiction it's already, takes that? It, well, all right, they've sure. already voted on it and the, and the posture it's in. They would have to do a vote to 
include this as well. That's your intention, and we just want to make sure yeah, that this, this came is. this came from the county council from Baltimore County specifically. Their attorney for the county council and said we had to do it this way okay. in order for them to come back and pass it and put that in the statute. Okay. Yes. So make sure your that same question was asked yesterday, and and we did check, and they said the same thing. Okay. So we're okay with the amendment. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good. Or to be double ending. Other questions? Okay. That concludes the hearing on that piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 595, Senator Klausmeyer. Bring up your team. Great. Good afternoon, uh, members of the Budget and Taxation Committee, uh, and it's so good to have our chair back and uh, our vice chair, too. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to see. You. But uh, Senate Bill 595, gaming problem, problem gam gambling fund, table games, fees, and distribution of sports wagering proceeds. Uh, for the record, Senator Kathy Klausmeyer. In Maryland, as we have steadily expanded the ways people can legally gamble, the General Assembly has ensured a funding stream to address the problems that arise from people who cannot limit their participation. In legislation, this body passed back in 2007, we ensured funding would go to the Problem Gambling Fund, with the allowance of slot machines or video lottery terminals. In 2012, we ensured funding would go to the prob Problem Gambling Fund when we expanded to table games. We neglected, however, to create an effective funding stream with the expansion to sports wagering. I'm sure the members of this committee have seen the many ads for sporting sports betting apps but advertising to bring awareness to the problem gambling cannot keep pace. That's what this bill is about. The bill has two parts. First, the bill requires each video lottery operation licensee to pay an annual $500 fee for each table game with the money going to the problem gambling fund. This is important because casinos have removed other table games and VLTs to make sure for their make room for their sports books. This has resulted in reduction of funding for problem gambling fund. The reduction has meant Maryland has been investing less in the resources to help Marylanders, Marylanders suffering the harms of this addiction. The fee increase will allow these programs funded by the problem gambling fund to continue working at their usual capacities. Second, this bill directs 1% of the proceeds from sports wagering in the state lottery fund to the problem, problem gambling fund. When the General Assembly legalized sports wagering in Maryland, it specified that any funds that were not claimed in 182 days after the wager is won would go to problem gambling fund. An unforce unforeseen problem we have realized is that more than 90% of people that place their sports bets online. Unlike lottery tickets where a winner must go to a retailer to claim their prize, the payout when a person places a bet online goes directly into the account of the player um, who has established the sports book operator. Again, unlike a small portion of lottery winnings, online prizes never go unclaimed. There are zero dollars in unclaimed funds for the vast majority of sports wagering. The 1% pre 
proposal in this legislation will correct the unexpected error so that Maryland can be more adequately funded to support those who need help. And we need more resources. The latest gambling prevalence study conducted in Maryland in 2020 showed a substantially higher prevalence than in the surveys conducted in 2017 and 2010. There is little doubt that this incidence of problem gambling will continue to grow as we make it easier for people to gamble in many different ways. So let's make sure we're providing the resources to address this problem. And I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 595. And I, I just think it's this is very, very, very important bill. And because it is, I think as time goes on, we will see more and more people uh, that have problem gambling. And the other thing is, uh, I don't know if we have to contact the lottery or whatever, but um, in other states, when they have the ads for uh, the, the, the gambling, uh, the sports wagering, you can't even see a little sign that says, you know, problem gambling question mark. You can't even see that. So that's something else I think we need to to work on. So thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Gazzone and committee members. My name is Mary Drexler. I am the director of the Center of Ex Maryland Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling, and I'm here today to testify in strong support of Senate Bill 595. The center is fully funded by the Problem Gambling Fund to promote healthy and informed choices regarding gambling and problem gambling. We take a public health multi-pronged approach to all the work we do. Our services include a 24-hour helpline, public awareness, clinical training, peer recovery support services, prevention, community outreach, public policy, research, and evaluation. I'd like to give you just a small snapshot of what we've been experiencing since sports betting legislation. The center employs five certified recovery support specialists who are in recovery from problem gambling and other co-occurring addictions. Yearly, the center peers alone connect with more than 400 Marylanders seeking support on their road to recovery. With the increase in helpline calls, the center needs to consider hiring more staff to keep up with the demand for help and support. It has been clear in the past several months that our helpline is experiencing an increase in not only calls, but texts and chat since sports betting went live, especially online and mobile. Sports books also have a big marketing and advertising budget that far surpasses what is in the problem gambling fund. The center needs to continue targeted counter marketing and public awareness campaigns to ensure Marylanders have access to the resources they need. Sports betting also generally attracts a younger, Demographic, thus our public awareness and marketing needs to expand to include new forms of media with this demographic. Simply put, additional funding, 1% of the proceeds from sports wagering in the lottery fund is necessary for us to not only continue, to, but to move forward with the work we do, especially to meet the expanding needs linked to sports betting legislation. With any expansion of legalized gambling, the impact on Marylanders needs to be considered and the funds to respond to those needs must be considered. I strongly request a favorable report on SB 595. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Gazone and members of the committee. My name is Will Heyman, and I'm a certified peer recovery sports specialist for the Maryland Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling. I'm also a person in long-term recovery from sports gambling, an addiction which cost me not just financially, but also impacted my life in so many other negative ways over the years, including hindering my ambition and motivation to pursue my full life potential and two failed marriages and broken homes, which also affected my children. My sports gambling accession began in college when I was a junior around 20 years old, after which I felt the need to have a wager on the game in order to have any interest in it. After college, my motivation and interest in pursuing the career path associated with my degree diminished, which I attribute to the lifestyle I was living and turning to gambling and alcohol as an escape. During my two failed marriages, if I wasn't out at the bar watching the games, I was always keeping an eye on the scores, stats, preparing to place my next bet, and watching the games at home. 
Unfortunately, both of my children also had to suffer from my preoccupation and impact of the consequences from my mistakes through two broken homes. I've worked incredibly hard over the last several years as a single father to make that up to my children. But unfortunately, unlike money, there are some things we simply cannot replace. If I could go back as that 20 year old knowing what I know now, I have no doubt my life would have taken a completely different trajectory. Unfortunately, we can't relive our past, which is why the center believes it is vitally important to make sure ample funding is available to educate the community on the risks and to make sure that they know that there are plentiful resources available should, they, should it become a problem and, they need, and someone needs help. This can turn into a family problem very quickly and can be every bit as destructive as drugs and alcohol. It only takes someone crossing that invisible line one time and chasing their losses for it to turn into a financial mess. As a peer for the center, I've already seen an increase in calls from the aggressive marketing campaigns. And I, um, I definitely believe there's gonna definitely need to be an increase in funds in order to, to uh, be able to take care of needs. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Gazan and committee members. My name is Ken Wolfson, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from alcohol, substance abuse, and, uh, uh, and of course, gambling addiction. And by the grace of God, I have over 29 years of sobriety today. I am also a certified peer support specialist at the Maryland Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling. I joined the center six years ago as the very first problem gambling peer in the state of Maryland. I respectfully come before you today to request your support on Senate Bill number 595, which provides funding to address the increased needs for the support, education, and treatment of Maryland residents, some of which are caught in an endless cycle of gambling addiction. Since inception, the increased sports betting advertising campaign has been unavoidable. And of course, Maryland sports betting access now includes electronic devices. Therefore, it stands to reason that our awareness efforts must also increase to meet these new demands. Also troubling is the increase in calls for assistance and support from students, as well as moms and dads of college age students. This has been quite concerning for obvious reasons. Uh, imagine losing the power of choice. You can't stand to place even one more bet and yet you can't stand not to. And I should know I've been there and I have lived that horrible nightmare, ignoring financial responsibilities while uncontrollably sinking deeper into fear, shame, and debt. Imagine behaviors such as lying, cheating, stealing, deceiving people, all become fair game to satisfy the overwhelming demands of a gambling addiction. As peers, we use our lived experience to educate Maryland residents on how to keep gambling safe and fun if they choose to gamble, as well as providing support, help, and hope to those in need. Passing this bill will allow the center to meet the increasing needs of Maryland's rapidly evolving gambling landscape. Thank you. Hello, Chair Gazone, members of the committee. My name is Brian Rossine, and I'm a student in the Public Health Law Clinic at the University of Maryland Carey Law School. I'm here today to discuss the connection between sports wagering legalization and an increase in problem gambling prevalence how states across the country are responding to this trend by enacting uh, dedicated funding and their sports wagering uh, legislative text, and why Maryland should follow the lead of these states. From 2018 to 2021, the National Council on Problem Gambling estimated there was a 30% uh, increase in risk of gambling addiction. This is significant as 2018 was the year of the Murphy v. Uh, v NCAA decision, which struck down the federal prohibition on allowing states to allow uh, sports wagering. States across the country have seen a rapid uptick in problem gambling helpline calls since they enact their respective sports wagering uh, legislation. And in response to these trends, uh, many states, over half of which have sports wagering uh, legalized, have included provisions in that text to dedicate problem gambling treatment and service funding. With the national best practice recommended by the National Council on Problem Gambling being 1% of sports wagering revenue. The neighboring states of Virginia and Pennsylvania have both included dedicated percentage funding to their sports prob uh, problem gambling treatment and service funds, with Virginia even going beyond the recommended best practice and dedicating 
As mentioned before, Maryland saw a increase of over 2% in problem gambling prevalence from 2017 to 2020. And this was before sports wagering was legalized in the state. Maryland has also seen an increase in problem gambling helpline calls since enacting sports wagering uh, legislation. So the trend is likely to follow suit here in Maryland and see an increase in problem gambling prevalence even more than before it was legalized. Legislation is the most effective way to dedicate problem gambling treatment services funds, and Maryland should follow the lead of these states to ensure that the likely uptick in problem gambling prevalence is taken care of. For these reasons, I request a favorable report on this bill, and thank you for your time. I just have uh, one question I understand uh, that this deals with problem gambling, but is there a direct relationship with the revenue associated with the actual sports, uh, the amount of money that they are taking in as a result of how, how it's happened with the actual gambling? Because more people gamble uh, are the, is the revenue for the sports teams, has that gone up? And, and I only ask this because I, I just tell you, this happened in my house. I'm not sure if it happened to everybody else's, but with sports gambling, the Super Bowl that we watched this year was the most watched Super Bowl we've ever watched mm -hmm. in probably 10, right? Because it was a lot of fun. Everybody was playing. They were in, you know, every, every play was important. And I just wanted to know the revenue that, that the sports teams, has it driven people back to watch more sports, to become more involved? That was my question. So are you asking if the sports teams have increased their revenue uh, as a result of sports wagering legalization? Yes. I do not have the direct answer to that. Um, I believe, especially in Maryland, yeah. since this is such a recent enactment, the data is still being collected. Uh, so I, I think I can indirectly kind of answer that question because I had a we did an event at a school in Anne Arundel County a couple of weeks ago, and I had a teacher say, yeah, my husband and all my kids, we download those apps and we're all gambling on the games. Not that it become a problem with any of them at that time, but certainly I would imagine that would increase their interest to want to watch the game and see what happens. Does that help? Ms. Drexler, I, I, I think this is probably best directed to you. What's your budget? Our budget, what we get from the problem gambling fund, and some of the money goes to other things, uh, we get right now approximately 2.4 million. And how many staff do you have? Right now, including myself, um, I have 13 other staff. Thank you very much. No other questions for this panel? All right, thank you very much. I have two, I believe I have two people online. Nancy, Rose and Cullen. She was up there. But I am, but uh, oh. they said my video's unmuted or something. So my picture is not there. I'm trying to get that. It says, you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. <laughs> so should I? Um, you could just go ahead with... Okay. Your testament. Oh, there you, there you are. There you are. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm not that technologically advanced. Um, I I want to thank the chairman and I want to thank Senator Klausmeyer. I'm Nancy Rosencone, the executive director of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. I would like us to look at this bill from a public health point of view. It, gambling is an addiction. And in many cases, it's associated with mental health issues and alcohol and substance use disorder. So to ask for 1%, that is actually to help people uh, through the Maryland Center of Excellence, but it is actually to help people that have um, multiple uh, situations. I don't believe gambling comes just by itself as an addiction. It usually has a substance use disorder associated with it, as well as a mental health Dis, you know, disorder. So my thing is, when there are additional monies, um, if 1%, a small percent could make a difference in somebody's life and change the family dynamics and change that individual, then we should look at this from a public health point of view. 
It's a public health standard that if you add prob- if you add money to problem gambling fund when expanding it, then let's look at it from a public health point of view and let's make sure we can help people, as many people as possible. Uh, this legislative session has been all about changing and all about helping people. And Senator Gazone has been a major supporter of, of ours um, and from the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee and, uh, Senator, and Klaus, Senator Klausmeyer has always been helpful to us. And it's a public health crisis. Um, because people lose their lives, they lose their well-being, they lose their families, as this gentleman said. So being director of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence always takes me to a public health point of view. And 1% is a lot. So I thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for her virtual witness? No, oh, yep, please. Yeah, I um I absolutely agree with the bill. The only thing that gives me pause on is that we we have protected this um this uh trust fund education trust fund with everything we've got and with the blueprint coming up as it is i hate to start down that road of taking money from the education trust fund for something else um i just i i think we need to look for another way to pay for it but I, I just don't think the education trust fund is the place to take the funding from. May I answer that? I sure. understand that. Um, but this is education and this is outreach. It may not be education in a building, but this is education. And it's a different aspect of education, but it, it, it truly is. And I understand your concern about that because it is going to the blueprint. Um, but I feel this is part of advocacy and education and outreach to young people, especially to the people that are in high school, that are going to the schools, that are getting some of the education funding, but then they're also leaving the schools and they're gambling. And whether their parents know it or not, they're walking around with their phones and they're gambling. So I understand you and I appreciate and respect your position, but I I do want to stress that I do believe that this is education. Thank you. And and I, I have to agree with that because as the gentleman said, he got into college and had there been more awareness through an education type program, uh, he may not have gotten in the quagmire that he did. And actually, I got into the, this problem gambling situation through a gentleman who he he hated it when and we're some of us might be guilty of this. You go get a scratch off and give it to your kids. And it starts way back when they're mm-hmm. little. Yep. And uh, so I, it's something that we really have to keep an eye on and really uh, don't don't think it's not happening. So, and it can happen very, like I said, very, when they're very young, so. Oh, very good. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate Thank your you. testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You for that good question, Senator. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, 621, Senator Zucker. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, distinguished members of this committee. Uh, For the record, Senator Craig Zucker here on uh, Senate Bill 621. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know uh, since we're doing a live feed, sometimes uh, those folks that are watching couldn't see the the most recent uh, bill hearing. But one of the things that struck me was um, the sponsor of that bill talking about problems with ads and the many ads that are on TV. So what this bill does is Uh, And it's going to be amended. And I think once it's amended, there should be no opposition. But what it does is it just creates a process through the uh, Lottery and Gaming Commission to have an independent uh, validator. Uh, We'll amend it to be voluntary, but to make sure that um, the content that's coming out of sports books and others um, are uh, 
our screen and legitimate. And just really, this is a consumer protection uh, bill. Uh, we've seen this uh, be an issue in other states. So Maryland is trying to take a posture of being uh, proactive in protecting our consumers and, and making sure that um, uh, those sports books are vetted and, and that what they're providing are legitimate. I do think that we are, um, I do think that we have great uh, sports books in the state of Maryland. Uh, we just try to be proactive and I certainly appreciate uh, the many entities that have communicated with me and my office to where we believe we can create a, a roadmap for the future uh, while making sure that everyone is in support of this legislation. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I turn it over to my panel unless there's any questions. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Adams. I'm the founder and CEO of SharpRank, uh, which is one of the independent evaluators in this space. Um, we are a Maryland-based company. Uh, and I think the genesis of our company is really tells the story here. Um, I, I come from investment banking. Um, so you can imagine my surprise when I heard a radio ad of somebody uh, making st statistical claims about their ability to pick games and then guaranteeing people money. Um, uh, after going through licensure and compliance with the SEC and FBI background checks, I found it a little odd. Uh, and so when I dug down, what, what I found was a bit of a structural flaw that can proactively be fixed. Um, and what that structural flaw is, it's the same as banking, where equity research and equity trading can no longer talk to each other because it creates a compliance, uh, a, a conflict of interest. And what you have now is a very similar infrastructure that sets up to have very negative effects. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is <laughs> industry participants are willing to play ball and willing to be a part of the solution and a part of consumer protection. It is the first thing out of their mouths when they discuss what is a key priority for you, okay? I, I think the amended bill that's being suggested is great. I think it sets up a process for those who, who want to take that next step and who want to do it because this is not anti-business. What this does is it squeezes out the black market because if every restaurant has a health inspector grade on the window and those offshore bo books do not, foot traffic will stop there. It helps with SEO at Google. And more broadly, it sets a standard for validation that's super important for the consumer to be protected. So uh, I'm, I'm in strong support of this amended bill. Thank you. Questions for uh, Senator McCray? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you for bringing the bill forward. I know that we had talked um, already could you just elaborate on who some of the other independent evaluators are? Sure. So at, as it currently stands, we are one of a few who would meet the criteria. Um, that being said, the second that this amended bill could go into place, uh, KPMG, PwC, um, all the big four accounting firms will jump into that space. But um, I, I I believe there's there's a misconception that we are the only one who meet that criteria. And that, that is not the case. People can do what we do. They choose not to because there has yet to be the, the uh, appetite for it. We're just here to uh, center out the uh, structural flaw. And just wanted to confirm, it sounds like there are amendments that are coming forward and the amendments would address the issues that the Gaming Commission brought up in their letter of testimony? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah, we've been, Senator, we've been working very closely with them and uh, they've been uh, partners on this. So whatever, obviously it's the wisdom of the committee, but um, the bill with the amendments that are being offered, I think addresses any, I know addresses any of the concerns that they have. Very good. Question, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I have, um, <clears throat> Two unfavorables, one on in person and one in line. Tyler Bennett.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Budget and Tax Committee. For the record, uh, I am Tyler Bennett on behalf of Live Casino and Hotel in Anne Arundel County. Um, we operate the uh, sports and social uh, sports book at our facility uh, in partnership with FanDuel, as well as operate an, uh, an online mobile betting platform um, in, in partnership with them as well. Um, as this bill was drafted, um, we had major concerns with the um, required contractual relationship language um, that was in the bill. Um, as we've heard the amendments, um, and though I've yet to see it, the actual language, um, I, I, I think um, those major concerns have been, um, for the most part, have been alleviated. Um, there's certainly a place um, for these types of services out in the marketplace. It was just that the, that state mandated requirement um, that we uh, had concerns with. So we appreciate the sponsor's work on it. Um, we appreciate the continued conversations with him. Thank you. Okay. Uh, online, we have uh, Kerry Watson. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kerry Watson. I'm Regional Vice President for Government Affairs for MGM Resorts. I wish I could be there in person with you. Trust me, I really do. Um, but I'm here in opposition of SB 621 as drafted. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to see the amendments firsthand, but I hear hopefully that they have alleviated some of the concerns that we might have had, and I'll continue, we will continue to work with the sponsor on that. I did hear some testimony just a moment ago uh, that suggested that companies or individuals are talking about guaranteed winnings. I can assure you that those are not gaming operators that are offering guaranteed winnings on anything. Uh, so with that, it's important to, if, if there is a difference between the individuals that he is speaking or if he's talking about the actual operators of sports betting, I think that needs to be said out loud. I just want to make sure that people are aware. Secondly, I think it's also important to note that we work extremely close with the, the regulator here, the Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Agency and the commission. And you know, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of regulators all over the country. And I will carefully, but surely say that this is one of the best. And I can assure you when we make a mistake, we are corrected by that agency. And if we betray the trust, if we were to betray the trust or approval of this agency, we can lose our license to operate. And I think in terms of a motivation to do the right thing, that's a pretty significant one. Our global reputation is dependent upon this and we need to make sure that the legislature is aware that we take this very seriously and we'll continue to work with the MLGCA to ensure that we're just in line doing what we're supposed to do. So with that, I look forward to working with the sponsor and with the MLGCA on this proposal. Questions for the virtual witness? Oh, yes, Senator Benson. Mr. Watson, tell, tell us again who you represent. Who? Yep. MGM Resorts and on behalf MGM. of that MGM. Yes. MGM. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, very, very good. Thank you for testimony. Yep. We can go on to the next bill. I'm actually going to do this. Okay. Um, 623. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, distinguished members of the committee. For the record, Senator Craig Zucker here uh, presenting Senate Bill 623. Uh, for many of you, uh, this bill might look familiar. That's because it is familiar. Uh, we had something very similar last year that passed out of the committee near unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chairman, colleagues, uh, as you might remember, some years ago, we passed a sports betting uh, bill that uh, included um, uh, some uh, electronic bingo halls. And what this does is this is trying to create more uh, equity and, and opportunity, quite frankly, and, and more revenue for the state by, uh, by allowing, uh, by allowing uh, electronic bingo machines to be expanded, uh, which will, again, help toward revenue and help uh, with fairness uh, for, uh, for those that, that want to expand. Uh, and uh, with that, I would turn it over to, uh, to uh, a future panel, <laughs> wherever they may be. <laughs> Questions for right. Senator? Okay. Hello, future panel. Hello. How are you? How are you? <laughs> 
Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members. Aaron Appel with Capital Strategies here on behalf of Delta Bingo, Delta Waysons Bingo, and Abners. I'd like to begin by providing some background on bingo, the history of bingo in the state of Maryland. Um, I think many of you already know this, so forgive me. I'll be quick. Um, traditional bingo, as we think of it, with bingo cards and daubers has existed for decades, and the addition of electronic instant bingo, as the code, as the Maryland Code defines it, um, began in the early 2000s. The internal mechanisms of the machines, the uh, electronic instant bingo machines, are different than the slot machines that are operated by the casinos, which, it should be noted, came along a decade plus later. Legislation was introduced in 2008 to crack down on those machines that were being operated in an illegal manner, untaxed and unregulated, but to permit those who have always been good actors to continue to operate. The companies that operate today and are included in this bill are those good actors. They are taxed at 35% and they are regulated both locally and by the Maryland Lottery. They have consistently played by the rules. We are talking about jobs and revenue to the state and to two localities, Anne Arundel County and Calvert County. And while not at the level of the casinos, it is significant revenue. This body made the thoughtful and proactive decision to permit these six facilities to continue to operate. And our ask is simply that you allow them to stay competitive in light of all of the other entertainment options that have come online in the past decade, first slot machines, then table games, and now sports betting. New sports betting operators, I would say every month it appears that they, they seem to be approved. And um, we're just simply asking that you allow these six longstanding commercial bingo operators to uh, be permitted to operate a limited number of new machines so that they can maintain tax uh, revenue as well as jobs by staying relevant and in business. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman and members, my name is Craig Romack, and I'm the operations manager of Delta Bingo and Gaming here in Maryland. We have two locations, one in Laurel and Lothian, both in Anne Arundel County. I am here today in support of Senate Bill 623. Bingo in general, as well as electronic bingo, have a long history in Maryland. We were here well before sports betting, casinos, their slot machines, and table games. For decades, we've operated within the bounds of the law, fully licensed, taxed, and regulated, at first by the county and now by the state lottery. In fact, many years ago, before my time, we actually went to the county to ask that we re be regulated. We've been working with them as partners ever since. To be clear, the gaming tax we pay is a total of 35% on our net proceeds, 25 to the state and 10 to Anne Arundel County. While clearly not at the level of casinos, the taxes we pay mean pretty significant funding to the state and county. We're not seeking to blow up our industry. We're a tiny speck in comparison to large casinos. Just last month, they generated 157 million in revenue. That's just from one month of February. We're not taking away from the casinos. We're simply asking you to help us stay competitive and in business, while at the same time increasing state and local revenue. We have long serving employees, Maryland residents, many of whom have been with us for decades. The fact that casinos have collectively left 7,500 machines on the table, no pun intended, that they've been authorized by this body to operate speaks directly to this fact. They left 7,500 machines on the table, and we're simply asking for 50 more machines to our two locations. Even then, we would still have less than 200 total at each. In closing, I'd like to underscore that this bill is about jobs and tax revenue. When you added table games, it was the same thing, jobs and tax revenue. Sportsbook, same thing, jobs and revenue, and soon online casinos as well. So a bingo company asking for more bingo machines shouldn't be a tough call. So it's just more business, jobs, and tax revenue. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Sushant Sid uh, with Capital Strategies here on behalf of Delta Bingo and, and other clients. And I will, first off, I want to thank the chair and the sponsor of the bill. I know you guys had worked on this last year, and we appreciate the effort. I know it was a uh, difficult bill, um, but, it, but we do appreciate it. I want to touch on just a couple of things. Number one, um, we are adding machines to places that already have gaming. And they had gaming prior to the casinos. So it's not an expansion of gaming. Uh, I know some of the opponents may try to bring that up, but the fact of the matter is 
They run machines currently, and these are the same machines that they will continue to run. Um, number two, the casino industry in the state of Maryland has been authorized to operate 16,500 machines. They do not operate that number of machines now. Uh, they operate less, sorry, they operate 7,500 less than they are authorized to operate. There is a reason for that because the tax rate is so high. We're actually, we're asking for more machines. You guys have authorized this number of machines that are not being op operated. We're more than happy to try to make up the balance. Um, as Ms. Appel said earlier, uh, we are good actors. We've been operating for decades. We've had no compliance issues. I cannot say the same thing for our, our uh, friends in the casino industry. Um, but again, th this really should be an apples to oranges conversation. We are not casinos. We cater to a different population, different clientele. Um, with that, urge a favorable report and take any questions. Questions for this panel? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, again, I have the same one in person and one online in opposition. I'm starting to take uh, it personally. <laughs> Tyler, <laughs> Tyler Bennett. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Again, uh, Tyler Bennett on behalf of Live Casino uh, and Hotel um, in Anne Arundel County here in respectful uh, opposition to this bill. Um, you know, we, we've seen this bill in the past. Um, these machines um, to the consumer are virtually identical uh, to slot machines, uh, although they may operate differently inside um, from the customer's perspective. Um, they're they're playing a slot machine. They look like them. They sound like them. Um, it, it's it's the same experience. Um, and although not all of the bingo halls have um, um, sports books, uh, as I understand it, uh, two of them do. Um, and with the proliferation of that, um, and potentially more, um, those lines are are continue uh, to be blurred um, between um, the the bingo halls and the gaming facilities. Um, we have provided uh, as an industry as a whole since 2008, nearly $5 billion to the Education Trust Fund. Um, and, and every dollar of that is important. Um, and um, we don't believe that the, the state should be taking any dollars away from that. And um, with that, um, just ask for an unfavorable report. Thank you. Mr. Watson. All right. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Once again, Kerry Watson, Regional Vice President of Government Affairs for MGM Resorts City National here in opposition of Senate Bill 623. Um, my colleague there, Tyler, said a lot, and I just want to add on a few important points. You know, we talked about this last year. If any of you have never visited one of the bingo halls, I, I absolutely think you should. And it's, it's actually very impressive. And the technology on these machines have improved so much that I would dare any of you to obviously tell the difference between a slot machine and one of these ITLMs or bingo hall machines. You know, they are correct. Bingo halls are not casinos. And in 2008, the legislature and the referendum that from the state of Maryland passed a piece, uh, passed a referendum that would allow four or five and then a future six, a sixth gaming site. Uh, they are two different entities. There is a reason there are two different entities. Uh, but as these businesses have continued to excel and grow with their technology and their machines, they have also been able to have the opportunity to get into gaming, if you want to call it that, through sports betting. And they just did that last year. But yet we continue to have this conversation about their continued growth. What I would ask each member of the community to do is take a moment to go to a bingo hall and look inside, enter through the doors. See if they've made the investments in security and the regulatory process that we've had to make. And of course, as they mentioned, they don't pay the same tax rate that we pay. There's a difference that they, there's a reason that there's a difference. We are a remarkably highly regulated business that provides remarkable dollars to the Maryland Education Trust Fund specifically. MGM National Harbor specifically early last year, got over the $1 billion mark in monies to the Education Trust Fund. And I know that that is a priority of this state. So with that, 
I would encourage a, an unfavorable on this bill. And I look forward to working with you guys in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for these witnesses? Thank you all very much. Includes the hearing on that bill. We're going to move on to Senate Bill 735. Senator Rosepep's going to take over for a little bit. Um, Senator Zucker is back. Welcome. Yeah, I'm on a roll, I guess. Bring all uh, your merry band up. Uh, for the record, Senator Craig Zucker on Senate Bill 735. And we do have a big band here and we're all singing from the same sheet of music. Um, colleagues, uh, you might remember uh, last year, uh, this committee did uh, most of the heavy lifting. We had legislation in that would have done uh, two things. Uh, and it's regarding the education support for professionals. So that's your bus drivers, your paraeducators, folks that work inside uh, buildings. And at that time, what I said in our public testimony, and it was the chair, the committee and others, was that you know, we have a workforce shortage. And also at that time, I had, made, I had said that uh, currently the National Guard were driving school buses in Montgomery County. So we did two things. Uh, we had a bill in last year that provided a bonus to your education support professionals and the work group. And when I said a lot of the heavy lifting was done last year, uh, we actually passed both. Uh, we uh, were able to secure with the people at the panel and, and working with you all, all of you, a bonus for our education support professionals. And we were gonna establish a work group. And uh, it, I guess it, it was changed in the house. It might have run out of time. We were successful in getting um, the bonuses done and another round of bonuses that was worked out with the administration but we're unable to um, get the work group codified. And why is that important is uh, right now we have problems retaining and attracting these wonderful uh, professionals who, um, who provide uh, invaluable resources within our uh, public school uh, structure and beyond. And uh, we want to figure out long-term ways, uh, long-term solutions really with, with stakeholders and advocates on how we can address um, address the uh, the shortage and also retain these uh, fabulous uh, individuals. So that's really what this legislation does. It uh, There's no longer that bonus funding piece, but now we just want to make sure that we guarantee that the work group uh, is, is created. So colleagues, that's the bill in front of you. And we have just an absolutely fantastic uh, panel uh, that will help uh, further describe the merits of this. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Why don't we uh, take your uh, panelists and then we'll open it up all the way for questions. If that's okay, Senator. Good afternoon, Chair Rosa Pepp, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Cheryl Bost and I'm a fourth and fifth grade teacher from Baltimore County, proudly serving as the president for the Maryland State Education Association, representing over 75,000 educators across the state, including our education support professionals and over 3 million as part of the National Education Association across the country. Very simply put, thank you for passing the bonuses for our education support professionals, and thank you to Senator Zucker for, for uh, leading that charge. That goes a long way, but it doesn't go far enough. Our education support professionals are essential employees and should be able to work one job to make ends meet. I want you to think about your day or your time here in the session. You have staff back in your offices answering uh, constituent calls, getting paperwork ready for you. Uh, you have security guards. You have custodial services here in the Senate. And I'm sure you appreciate each and every one of them. We appreciate our education support professionals, but too many of them are leaving because the pay is so low. These are people that we entrust to help us with the academic and social emotional success of our students, and we need them. And so to do that, we want to study all of the aspects of their jobs to make sure that we are providing great salaries, benefits, and working conditions for education support professionals. If I could say personally, I'm sure Senator Benson, as a former teacher, she would tell you the two people in the school you want to talk to and get to know well first is the front office secretary and the custodian, because those are going to be the people who are going to take care of the school, take care of you. And when things get tough, they're the first ones on site. 
And so we want to take care of these essential employees. We are losing too many of them to Amazon. We are down over 14% of our bus drivers. Many of them have gone to work in private industry where they can make more money. Some of our employees can make more at McDonald's. And we're talking about the very people who serve your children food, take care of them in the health suites, and add to their academic success. So I'm encouraging you and asking you on behalf of our members to please vote favorably on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Pass the mic. Good afternoon. My name is Pia Morrison. Good afternoon, Chairman Gazone, Vice Chair Rosa Pep, and members of the Senate Budget and Tax Committee. Um, I'm president of SEIU Local 500, which represents approximately 20,000 working people in Maryland and 9,000 support over 9,000 support staff professionals in Montgomery County Public Schools. I am proud to stand here alongside Senator Zucker, MSCA, and other organizations to support Senate Bill 735. Um, SEIU represents paraeducators, bus operators, office staff, building service workers, food service workers, and many more. We're very thankful to Senator Zucker for being the champion of K-12 education and for our members. Senate Bill 735 forms a work group to study wages for support staff across our state and to make recommendations on how to attract and retain staff. Support staff are essential to the school day, but for far too long, they've not gotten the respect nor the recognition that they so richly deserve. School support staff are the backbone for the safe, healthy, and supportive learning and working environments that must exist if students are to succeed. For their extraordinary and essential commitment, support staff deserve fair wages and recognition for the value they bring to education. During the pandemic, our food nutrition staff continued preparing and distributed millions of meals to Montgomery County students each day. Security staff supported that effort and so did bus drivers. Our instructional technology staff worked to support the delivery and repair of Chromebooks and hotspots to support online learning. Building service workers performed additional sanitizing procedures in buildings and our maintenance workers worked to ensure that the air quality was the way that it needed to be to ensure safe air for staff and students. Warehouse workers distributed PPE, masks and home testing kits. Actually, so many people had to pivot their work to online learning and to online support for schools and staff. As a result of this hard work, I'm respectfully asking that you all support Senate Bill 735. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members, and thank you for this opportunity to be with you today as an SEIU Local 500 member and to share my strong support for Senate Bill 735. My name is Sally Murick, and I am a paraeducator and the coordinator for the paraeducator program with Montgomery County Public Schools, where I have worked to support staff and the instruction of students for 32 years. I want to say a special thank you to Senator Zucker for his leadership on this important issue. Educational support professionals, specifically paraeducators, were left out of the blueprint for Maryland's future for them to be recognized and respected as the integral partners in student instruction and learning that they are. They were, mo were removed in the 11th hour before passage of the bill, and I hope the work group being formed by this legislation will rectify that mistake. They serve as co-educators and are due the same respect and recognition. Montgomery County Public Schools has approximately 2,700 paraeducators. 60% of those have a four-year degree. Another 20% have a master's degree, and we even have a few that have a number of them that hold PhDs. Our paras have chosen this as their career, not because it's all they can do. They love supporting the academics and the growth of our students. They are flexible and willing to use their instructional knowledge and skills to quickly support school operations and instructional needs in real time as situations arise. During COVID and continuing through our current school year, many, many paras have stepped in to be teachers covering classes for a day, a week, and even as long-term subs because of high staff absenteeism and unfilled teacher positions. Paras build relationships to envelop and promote the whole child, and it's not uncommon for students to have deeper relationships with paras or other educational support professionals rather than with their teachers. Paraeducators love working in schools and supporting the academic well-being and development of our students, but they have financial needs and families too. Low wages are affecting our recruitment and retention of these valuable and educated employees. 
More than half of all support staff work in full time in less than, uh, earn less than 35,000. 70% are paid less than 45,000. They are essential, but they are not paid as essential. I'm closing, I ask you to support Senate Bill 735. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Budget and Taxation Committee. My name is Keisha Goodwin. I'm a prior educator for 18 years in Baltimore City Public Schools. Today, I'm speaking to provide an insight on the hardship I face due to inadequate wages I receive for my skills and hard work. I am a resident in an expensive city. I also want the committee to understand why this bill is necessary. Therefore, I was compelled to attend this hearing. I have done the right things, graduated from high school, undergrad, and graduate school. Next, I decided to work in a system that prepared me for a living wage, the public school system. Working a full school day, then after school program and a side hustle leaves me with no energy or time to fully participate in family, friends, and community functions. I desire to travel, assist financially, to family and friends' weddings and birthday parties, donate to my community and donate to campaigns, but I cannot. Where is the money and the time going to come from? After 18 years, I still have a passion for working with children, yet where has this passion left me? Living in a community with low social economic status. I, am I not worthy of the American dream? I'm asking you to vote in favor of Senate Bill 735. Thank you, Senator Zucker. This committee co-sponsors for hearing us today. Thank you. Are there questions for the Senator or members of the panel? Senator Watson, our guest from Triple E. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Cheryl. Have have one question for you. Um, some folks seem to think I'm still on the Board of Education in Prince George, so I get a lot of emails. And the question I have is, do you regularly do exit interviews when staff leaves? And, and do you have kind of a summary of those that indicate that, you know, the, the number one reason is, is uh, monetary? Because the emails that I get talk about stress, uh, uh, talk about um, disrespect mm -hmm. in the classroom and a variety of other things that kind of all together you know, kind of influence a teacher's desire to leave. Do you have some data that I could take a look at? So in, in most systems, the human resources department will do exit interviews. We do polling uh, across the state. Uh, pay is the number one issue for our education support professionals when we do polling. But um, what you talked about is the culture, the respect, um, the uh, discipline, uh, comes up. And that's what the purpose of this committee will do is to look at all of those things that are impacting uh, the retention of our, uh, our education support professionals and see what we can do. One of the things is school systems don't do training for our education support professionals either. They train uh, teachers, they train administrators, and if they get to it, They'll train education support professionals on some of the latest behavior uh, remediation strategies and, and other things. So uh, we have surveys of our members. HR departments often do exit interviews, but that would be a great work for this uh, commission is to do some surveying of uh, why people are leaving and what would make people stay. Mm -hmm. Other questions for members of the committee? I have one, which I should know the answer to. Who works in a school who is not a teacher, who is not a principal or assistant principal, or is not in this category of education support? Does that cover the waterfront of all employees in schools? Sure. So you're at this point, you're talking about admin secretaries. Usually there's a registrar. There is a cafeteria. There are cafeteria workers and a cafeteria manager. And you're also talking about building services. And for Montgomery County public schools and secondary schools, you're also talking about security assistance and usually a security team lead, depending on the size of the school. So that, that, that these are the people who are in this bill that are, are in that are actually in the school day to day interacting with students and other staff, but or or, the, or or out of the school driving a bus. Absolutely right. I'm sorry, I'm not phrasing the question right. And they are all covered in this bill. 
Are they yes. not covered in this bill? Yes. yes. My yes. question is, is there anybody in a school building supervised like who is, is I'm sorry? Like administrators okay. would not be counted. If right. you're in a supervisory role, right. other education support professionals, you wouldn't be covered. There are a small number of hourly, um, uh, they call them triple A's, but a, a, a individual assistants that sometimes aren't part of bargaining units. Um, those are a small number of, of people, but most of them in the building are covered in some way by the education support professional title. Great. Thank you very, very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Benson. My apologies. Mm -hmm. Done this business for 50 years. <laughs> 50. Mm -hmm. It's all right to do the study. I can tell you all what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Don't have to ask anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm in and out of these schools. I can give you the real deal. Mm -hmm. We can study this thing until the cows come home. The question becomes, after we do the study, what are we going to do about it? We know the problem. We know the hardships that these, these paraprofessionals are called upon to do a look, look y'all. They are called upon to do everything. There's nothing that they're not called upon to do. And if they don't do it, they're held insubordinate. I can give you the story. The question becomes, what are we going to do about it? Now, I want to say to the unions, I love y'all. I am a union girl. But the unions have some responsibility here. Mm -hmm. You all need to kick it up. Because it doesn't make any sense where we're just talking about pay and working conditions for teachers and administrators. The people who really, the people who are really in the trenches and do the work, the bus drivers set the tone for what happens to children when they get to school. Mm -hmm. When that baby gets on that bus, mm -hmm. it's the bus drive that, that makes the difference. Yes, they can make or break a child's day. We know the problem. Mr. 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 Sponsor, sponsor of the bill, what are we going to do once we get the study? We know it. We, we, look, I can tell you. I can give you pages and pages of the problems that I see. The question becomes, what are we going to do to say to these local yokels who are in the school system negotiating our contracts, what are we going to do to, to compel them to do the right thing when it comes to these people who are sitting here today? Now, you know, I'm gonna support this bill wholeheartedly, but the question that remains, is we, I don't want us to spend a whole lot of time talking about the work group. What I want us to do is talk about what we're gonna do as a part of the solution. Because it, this is serious business. We're losing some of the best and the brightest, not necessarily because of salaries, but it's also because of the fact that these people have to be subjected to every kind of abuse that you can think of from parents and children. Look, I could talk about this stuff from now I tell, the question becomes, what are we going to do after we study this thing to death? Senator Walker, no. not that Senator Benson was putting you on the spot, but please no. give a chance well, to respond. Mr. Mr. Vice Chairman, just so you know, Senator Benson always puts me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so this, is, this is just really officially on the record. Um, look, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, that's why I'm you know, I'm a little disappointed that we didn't get the work group started last year. Um, I think, you know, Senator Benson, uh, you instinctually know, based on your, you know, your more than 50 years as an educator on some of the things that need to be addressed, but but not everyone has your experience. Certainly not everybody has your passion, and that's, that's for sure. Uh, but I think, um, you know, this is an opportunity to get everyone in the same room, uh, evaluate many of the issues that you already know instinctually and know how to get addressed, but it's to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And uh, that's why it's my hope that we get this bill out of committee sooner rather than later, get it out of the House of Delegates, and we can start coming up with long-term solutions on how to address these, these issues. Because uh, even though, Senator, you, you might know how to resolve it, uh, it's important for everyone else to, to understand that as well. And uh, it's important to have 
people in the room who are experts uh, to help resolve this. And uh, this isn't a union thing. This is about our school children. This is about the employees. Uh, uh, and, and that's why this committee overwhelmingly supported the bonus bill last year and voted this bill out unanimously. So we're just trying to get it right this year. Thank you. Other questions for the panel? Thank you very, very much. Do we have other witnesses in person? If they could come up to the uh, table. And if you could introduce yourselves and go in whatever order you like. Good afternoon, uh, community members. I'm, I'm Sam Walters. I'm a science paraeducator at Wild Lake High School in um, Howard County, Maryland. I first learned about, I've been there since 2018, so that's not very long for an old guy. I first learned about the plight of paraeducators and their importance for uh, from my partner who's a middle school science teacher in Howard County and listening to her stories for 18 years. Then in 2018, I started doing it and joined the union quickly. And soon after was asked to explain a new contract to back, uh, staff members and learned that <laughs> the pay of educators was way, way worse than even I had been led to believe the disparities. And so I started looking into the data, crunching numbers, which I've done for a lot of the rest of my career. Um, and I learned about the online, like living wage type websites that would give you numbers. And I started crunching those things and saw how incredibly far below uh, a sufficient income that most of our school based paraeducators are and uh, have then started doing county by county analysis. First started with Howard and got on this. Uh, MSEA, ESP statewide coordinating committee here to my colleagues on that. And we developed this ESP Bill of Rights. But what we need to do is be able to, um, as part of this study, I would suggest would be calculate living wage or wage sufficiency and then set targets for people to exceed that. Because I say exceed that because those numbers, those websites will tell you are a bare subsistence living, not really anything that is a comfortable standard of living. And we, we there's just a lot of little details that have to be, that I've learned over the last three or four years uh, that, and I'd be happy to share that with uh, the committee when it gets established, but you're gonna need a staff of people that can go through the minutia of the county and their pay system. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and honorable members of the committee. My name is Cindy Porter and I am a veteran education support professional currently in my 24th year working as a special education paraprofessional in the Carroll County Public School System. I'm here today to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 735 a bill which would establish a work group to study the wages of education support professionals and find a long-term solution to attract and retain skilled workers and professions that continue to gain foundational importance in the education of students across our state. What began over 23 years ago for me as an instructional assistant has exponentially expanded into a career requiring extensive background knowledge in educational curriculum, interventions, and most importantly, student emotional, behavioral, and mental health. At one time during my career, I worked two jobs for just under 14 years and three jobs for just under 12 years. During this time, I was also an involved mother of three who attended college when I could, finally earning my associate degree after 18 years in 2019. I speak of my story because at the age of 62, with over 23 years in my profession and two years credit given for my military service, I earned just over $35,000 per year. Please know that figure also includes wages earned working summer programs and some paid after school opportunities. For the past 18 months, I've had the privilege to speak to other education support professionals across our state because of my work with the Maryland State Education Association. These professionals hold crucial positions within our school systems and develop relationships with students who require more emotional, behavioral, and academic support than ever before. Sometimes those individuals sustaining injury because of those student behaviors. Many are working more than one job and some are choosing between necessities for their families. Their hearts are big, 
Their desire to help our students succeed is even bigger, but the earnings of many support professionals are not reflective of the essential nature of their positions. With this in mind, I respectfully ask the committee to vote in favor of Senate Bill 735. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, Chair, Mr. Chair, honorable members of the Budget and Tax Committee. My name is Cindy Popper, and I'm an education support professional in Harford County Public Schools. I'm 66 years old. Education is my third career. I have a bachelor's degree from Goucher College. I'm a 16 year veteran ESP. And even with market adjustments of our salaries over the last two years by Harvard County Public Schools, I make just barely $40,000 a year. And I'm considered a highly paid ESP. In my work with the Maryland State Education Association, I've had the opportunity to talk to ESPs across the state. Time and time again, I've heard stories about the sacrifices that they've had to make because of their extremely low salaries. Most school-based education support professionals earn under $30,000 a year. Many work two or three jobs. Some have to rely on the gratitude of others just to survive. And some incur stigma from participating in public assistance programs, even when working a full-time job. Education support professionals are not something that our school systems can do without. They're the glue that hold our schools and many times our students together. They make it possible for the neediest student to be successful and advance through school. They keep the buildings clean, heated, cooled, and safe. They ensure that our students have food to eat. They open and close the buildings each day and see that needed repairs are made. They keep computers running, answer phones, and greet parents when they enter our buildings. They are a necessity to the success of our schools, yet many are paid at lower rates than many fast food restaurants or big box stores. ESPs may not have teaching certificates, but we are all educators and we work daily to support our students. These important professionals deserve your attention. They deserve the work group this bill seeks to convene. They deserve the potential solutions it could provide. Education support professionals are asking for help. I respectfully ask the committee to return a favorable vote on SB 735. Thank you very much. Any questions from members of the committee? Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me, let me just say one more thing. There, there are just some things that you can't pay me to do. There are a few of those. But I, I just hope that this is more than just a study of the wages. And we, we all agree that the wages are important, but I'm trying to think of it in this critical era we're in with the blueprint, you know, unprecedented money, trying to fix what we believe will be, will give us the biggest bang in the state of Maryland, our education system, closing the achievement gap. You know, I'm personally interested in things related to school climate, you know, the safety, general working conditions, class sizes, training. You mentioned computers, infrastructure. What are the other things that we could potentially work on that if you're going to do a study anyway, you can get at the heart of the matter by really, you know, getting a hold of the metrics associated with exit surveys. These are the things, you know, that I'd be interested in looking at. So as we deal with the wages on one piece, you know, I'm going to go on a limb and say, if these other things that I just mentioned aren't in order, you know, the money doesn't matter that much. You really need the holistic, you know, everything to come together to make a good conducive learning working environment that allows you to help our kids learn. So I, I'd appreciate it. Not so much a question, just a, a comment and a suggestion, you know, as we move forward with this. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Would any panelists like to comment on the Senator's comments, please? I would just have a suggestion that, as you said, not only the wages, but I think there is, a general lack of understanding about the true functionality of many of these positions, if not all of them. They have come to the forefront in the past few years because of the pandemic, but also the extent of what is required in these positions in comparison to 10 years ago has, as I said in my comments, exponentially grown. And I don't think that there is a general understanding of the complete functions of what all of these individuals do. And I would suggest that. Thank you very much. I'd like to comment also that um, part of this, as Cindy just said, part of it is also the other things that we're now expected to do. And even the blueprint is gonna kind of exacerbate some of those. When you talk about moving teachers out of the classroom to do other things, uh, the, 
who do you think runs the classroom? It's most of the time those people. And as one of the other panelists said, we've been called to long-term sub for teachers that are not there. And we, and we do it all the time. And daily substitutes constantly every day. It, it's, it's, it's not a simple piece. It's a very complex puzzle. And, but it has to start somewhere. And the fact that most of these people do not make a living wage is despicable. Thank you. Senator. Son of a mother who was a retired principal in Prince George's County, who at the age of 80 is still teaching special ed. Because of the shortages in Prince George's County, I want to thank you all for what you do. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to working with you as we resolve this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Sir, briefly. Uh, with the, you said the word shortages. When we traveled around the state building support for this, our Bill of Rights, so many people were doing multiple jobs because of shortages in the school. So if we're if they're still being asked to do 1.5 jobs and we boost their pay, they're still their workload is still a crisis. So there needs to be attention to getting schools fully funded or fully staffed and paying all of those people the right wages. So it's, thank, thank you very, very much. Any other senators, questions or comments? OK, thank you all very, very much. And we have two uh, witnesses online. Um, one is Michael Kranick. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Kranick, and I am a Baltimore resident, Baltimore City Public School System special educator and secondary ELA. And I'm a proud member of the Baltimore Teachers Union, and I support heavily support this work study. Um, the result of this bill will finally bring to light all of the wage inequities in disproportionately affecting ESPs or otherwise as they're known in my district, PSRPs. They have a lifeblood of the school and I'll do my best to encapsulate everything uh, with one person in particular, a paraeducator named Mr. Lyman. He was the most respected and dedicated and beloved member of my school who went above and beyond every single day, no matter what was going on in his life. Whenever I was with him, I knew everything was going to be okay. I started uh, at Baltimore City at my current and only role, uh, fortunate enough to pay paired with Mr. Lyman six years ago. Throughout the years, we uh, continued to learn and support each other, making the best teaching team at our school. From watching our middle schoolers graduate as seniors to winning Teacher and Para of the Year awards in the same year, we got to see the fruits of our labor and we didn't have to visualize the impact of our efforts. We always joked that if the school closed or the district moved us, the other would follow because we're that good together. Unfortunately, this year, due to personal financial constraints and hardships, Mr. Lyman had to make a choice. A, continue working within the position he held over for, for over a decade, the partnership we had for six years, and the students and staff he loved so much, or B, explore other career opportunities that would lead to a living wage. In the end, Lyman chose the latter because he had no other choice. I believe passing this bill is essential uh, because I know that there are many other paras, paraeducators, ESPs in this position that make an unliving wage, and no one should have to choose between the work they love and the work they need to survive. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mr. Diggs. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Martin Diggs, president of Ace Ask Me Local 2250, and I represent almost 6,000 school employees throughout Prince George's County, and we are standing, I stand in support of this bill. Um, the work group and the study and the wages uh, of this education support professionals staffed by the Maryland State of the, the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, school support staff play an important role in ensuring students are learning in a safe and supportive environment. Our ASME members are in transportation, food services, health services, paraprofessionals, security, maintenance, clerical, IT workers, central office workers, ground people, uh, secretaries, dispatchers, ISSCAs, warehouse drivers, helpers, and also carpenters, so many that I can't even mention them all, all within Prince George's County Public Schools. School support staff can foster a positive, trusting relationships with our students and improve school climate by encouraging parent and family involvement with their students' education. 
School support staff can go beyond the curriculum by providing youth development resources for families and teachers that address trauma-informed practices and positive behavioral interventions because students connect with school support staff on so many occasions throughout the day. School support staff can model positive behavior and send positive messages to our students. Staffing shortages continues to be an issue within our schools and our support staff are being asked to do more with less and without the resources they need and without being compensated the proper compensation that they deserve. That's why I stand in support of this bill. And to this study is needed to be, we need to also to address resources for support staff in our public schools. Children need to be in a safe, flourishing environment. That's why I stand in support and ask for you to have a favorable decision on this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Are there any questions for our two online witnesses? Okay, thank you gentlemen very much. I think I did not invite up the rest of the on-site witnesses. So if there are other witnesses uh, signed up to testify, please come up to the witness table and share your thoughts and introduce yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tamika Peters and I am a staff associate at Liberty Elementary School in the great city of Baltimore. In my role, I support students and develop educators to reach awesome heights every day. I was also a certified teacher before I took this role. I am currently in the paraprofessional and school related personnel chapter of the Baltimore Teachers Union. I am writing and talking to you guys in support of SB 735 work group, the study of wages and education support professionals. Support staff and personnel are the heart and pulse of all educational systems. They are usually the first ones to arrive and the last to leave. In many districts, they are deemed essential as employees and in the need of supporting the staff and students in our school buildings. With all of that, majority of support staff in Maryland school districts are not making a living wage. A living wage is defined as the minimum income necessary, the minimum income necessary for a worker to meet their basic needs. Many support personnel do not make the minimum income to maintain a decent lifestyle and necessities. And to, due to this, they work longer hours or even take up another job just to make their ends meet. Support staff need to make a living wage. They need to be able to work on the level that they want and still enjoy life. They do not need to fear something in life happening that will put an extra strain on their already tight budget. Many support staffs are just one paycheck or even a situation like a car repair behind from falling behind. Once you add a family, that's a whole nother thing. Working in education is one of the most rewarding professions, but it's also one of the most underfunded, unappreciated, and underpaid in the city. For this and for many, many more things, I urge the committee to adopt a favorable report for SB 735 so that everyone can be happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank we're, you. On, we're on board for that. <laughs> Please. Hi, my name is Shamira Riley. I'm the secretary at Paul Kites Academy in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm also a paraprofessional and school-related personnel, and I'm a member of the Baltimore Teachers Union. I support Senate Bill 735 and I urge a favorable report on this bill. School secretaries are the heart of the school. We are the frontline workers that held our school together during the pandemic. I believe we have earned the right to receive improved on our current wages. There are education to support person professionals doing essential and incredible work all over the state of Maryland. Substantially, our schools and serving our community. Educational support professionals or PSRPs, like we say in Baltimore, experiencing unique challenges working in the inner city of Baltimore from not enough teachers to lack of books to outdated buildings that do not have proper air, condition, or heat. Through it all, we still provide countless hours of hard work and dedication to our students, way beyond our scheduled work hours in addition to our job titles. PSRPs have stepped up to help fill many of the teacher vacancies that our schools are experiencing, and we do so for low wages. 
lower than traditional teaching. Addition to inflation, most PSRPs can no longer afford our basic necessities. Our wages have not improved adequately over the years. Many of us have taken on second jobs just to make ends meet. This is why the study called for the SB 735 is so important. It should like to how low wages can't keep up with inflation and how this affects education support professionals in Baltimore and throughout the state. Um, I would basically strongly urge y'all to support this bill because it'll help keep more secretaries and other staff in the school system to help. Thank, thank you very, very much for joining us today. No problem. Members of the committee, have any questions for these panelists? Thank you very much. I believe that concludes the hearing, unless I miss somebody else. Okay, well, thank you. That concludes the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 735. We'll now go to uh, Senate Bill 643. Senator McRae, you have some uh, folks to join you. Please invite them up. How are you doing? I can't Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Corey McRae here to present Senate Bill 643. Um, Senate Bill 643, I almost feel like it's one of them legacy bills uh, um, that was passed by our chair or our Senate president, one of the two. But this uh, just makes sense. It, 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 what it does is the unclaimed property fund, it moves $5 million from that fund to be able to address issues that we have in all of our communities to deal with affordable housing, community revitalization, um, housing assistance, and things of that nature. When I think of this, I think of the Hoffer Road corridor for those from Baltimore. I think about the Bel Air Road corridor from if those from Baltimore. Or I think about good organizations like uh, Neha, uh, St. Ambrose, Benny, and so many on and on and on. We all all have them within our districts um, to make sure that life is enjoyable, to make sure that our business corridors are amenable, walkable, and uh, transpiring within, within those spaces. Um, Mr. Chair, I could say a lot about the bill, but I, I would like it to go favorable, but I would also like you to hear it from the people on the ground that's actually doing the work uh, from that standpoint, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Yes, Whoever sir. wants to go first. I'll go first. Thank you. Sorry. If you can introduce yeah. yourself, thank you. Hi, committee. Thank you. I'm uh, Latasha Gresham James with Dundalk Renaissance. I'm the executive director there, and I'm going to stick to my script so I won't go over time and get dinged. Um, we are a community development organization as well as a HUD approved count, uh, housing counseling agency. Operating support doesn't just pay the light bill, but it also provides uh, true living wages for our employees that manage a lot of capital dollars. And we have been fortunate to be one of those organizations that have received uh, Bernie funds from the state, uh, Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative grant from the state of uh, Department of Housing and Community Development from the state. And with those dollars, we really do need uh, more employees, of course, to help. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been able to receive additional funds that have expanded our services. And now that we now see that the pandemic is ending, um, we will you know, see the de decrease of those funds. And so we would like to remain. Um, this is in the last two years, we have not been able to have more than four staff members. We are now up to seven and a half, yay. Um, but we would like to keep it that way and keep expanding and continue to help increase uh, the amount of people we serve and support. So we would love the committee to continue to, uh, to support SB 643 and thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, um, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, committee members. My name is Frank Hodgetts, and I'm with a group called Home Partnership Incorporated, and we serve the rural areas, uh, Eastern uh, Maryland, the Eastern Shore. Um, I did want to thank uh, the Senator McRae, because as he has correctly pointed out, this is a legacy bill, and all you need to do is read it and review it to see exactly what sort of a passage it's had. 
because I think we've addressed many of the concerns, if not all of them, that have been brought up over the years we've tried to get this bill funded. Our organization has been in place for almost 30 years, and we've been working in Harford, Cecil, Kent, Queen Anne's, Talbot, Caroline counties, in order to provide affordable housing. And it's interesting to me that the bill that you just heard that involved the teachers and the paraprofessionals, those are our clients. Those are the folks that come to us every day because we provide not only pre-purchase counseling and education to help people learn the skills that they need in order to be good, strong homeowners and to pass that on to their children, but we also help people when they're in fear of losing their homes through foreclosure or bankruptcies. But we walk with them because people give us that confidence in order to do it. I can tell you that we've struggled in this area for a number of years. As my colleagues have mentioned, our staff is very small. There are two full times, full two full time uh, equivalents that work for us, two full time people, along with a 1099 and two part times. The suit that I'm wearing before you today, I bought when I was in high school. We we make ends meet. And that's what we've been doing for an awful long time. I'm awfully grateful for your time, for your representation here before us, and be happy to answer any questions at the end. And again, Senator McCray, thank you so much. Right again, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Claudia Wilson Randall. I'm the executive director of the Community Development Network of Maryland. Um, and thank you, Senator McCray, for introducing this legacy bill. We've been out this for some time. The Community Development Fund was originally passed in 2018. Um, and so we've been uh, working to put money in the fund for some time. And as we've been working, I just want to thank my colleagues for coming today uh, to talk about the work that they do for the communities across the state. Um, we've talked about Bernie. We also have the National C Capital Strategic Economic Development Fund, which is we talk about as NED. And we also have Community Legacy and Project Core. And these are all capital programs. So while why we are seeking this money is to really move those capital dollars. Um, many of those projects take more than a year to complete. So we see our organizations really struggle um, to move those capital dollars uh, without operating support. So I see this as a companion to, to those programs. Um, and before I close today, I want to just say that while we have worked during the pandemic, and many of these organizations are on the front lines in their communities, they're the organizations that are closest to the communities, and to, particularly to disinvested communities across the state. Um, but I'm thinking about Unity Economic Development Corporation in Suitland and Prince George's County, for example, that had to close prior to the pandemic. Uh, they were a group that they was doing excellent work. They were a HUD approved housing counseling agency. Um, they had capacity, but they did not have operating capital. And so while they spent you know, seven years building up capacity, they couldn't sustain their operations. I also think about Park Heights Renaissance Corporation that had to lay off uh, their their staff during the pandemic. Um, I'm thinking about um, the work in Dorchester County to build the Intergenerational Center at Chesapeake Grove on the Eastern Shore. These, these are the kinds of organizations and projects that get done with uh, capital dollars and we hope that you will pass uh, Senate Bill 643, so they have operating dollars to continue doing this fantastic work. Thank you very, very much. Are there any questions from senators for members of the panel? Or for Senator McRae? Yes, Senator Salling. Thank you, I just wanna welcome the Dunlack Renaissance who represents the area very well. They do a great job, and I wanna thank them for coming out and testifying with the good senator. And uh, uh, just thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, that concludes the hearing on this bill. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, the next bill is um, also Senator McRae, it's uh, 855. You have some folks to come up with you on this one as well, Senator? Yeah, they're supposed to be up there. <laughs> come up. We're joining them gladly.
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, um, Corey McRae, Senator for the 45th District, just here to present Senate Bill 855. And um, just as we were talking about affordable housing, as we're talking about the course corrections um, that we, we try to put forward, this bill does uh, sit well with my heart. It's one of the ones where I have quarterly meetings about to be able to understand the interim process. It's one of the ones that we've worked on as a legislature to kind of move the vacancies that happen, not just in the city of Baltimore, but also on the Eastern Shore was what was uh, communicated several years ago. And then when I think about the MREM process, for those folks that may not know, how we have it set up at the moment is those homes that uh, have tax liens or property taxes that are unpaid, um, as long as that threshold meets is over what the home would be worth or things of that nature, we're able to move through this process. Super excited. We've had our first 11 homes, I believe, that have went through uh, the interim process. And I'm like up next. Um, it's like a game show, March 29th. I hope that the courts will move my way and I can address some of the ones that are in the footprint that I'm trying my best to uh, move. But this is an expansion of that, Mr. Chair. And what they are looking at is these nuisance properties. So they may not always meet that threshold, but they are causing very much challenges. The people that have lived in neighborhoods for 40, 50 years, but then uh, right next door to something that may have went vacant, but they don't have the ability to get it in the good folks' hands, get it in the good folks' hands. What does good folks look like? Organizations that I'm working with in the 4x4, Nor uh, Northeast Housing Initiative, St. Ambrose Housing, Habitat for Humanity. So many of those folks want to help us with the challenges in the inundated vacant housing challenge that we have, but the court process is just so long. Um, and this just expands that court process. Mr. Chair, as I stated, I can talk on and on and on about MREM because it's one of the things that I'm trying my best to address the issues and grow my population in the city of Baltimore. But I have a number of folks that have been helping throughout this process and just wanted to give a shout out to those folks that are with DHC. That hit, listen to me, listen to me yell, listen to me uh, try to address it. But one of them sitting right next to me, Joe, uh, and then I also have Nicole Hart in the crowd. So I just wanted to thank them because these these public servants are working each and every day to address those vacancy challenges that we have. Mr. Chair, that is all I'm going to say, and I'll go to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Please, who wants to go next? All right. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nina Themelis, Interim Director of the Mayor's Office of Government Relations, here to testify in support of the Baltimore City Administration for SB 855. This legislation is a result of the convening of the tax sale work group, which Mayor Scott established in the fall of 2021. This group met over the course of about a year and uh, produced a number of uh, pieces of legislation for introduction this year. Um, this piece of legislation would expand, as this uh, senator said, the types of properties eligible to go through the MREM process uh, that is underway in Baltimore City to ensure that the city has more opportunities to reduce the number of vacant and abandoned properties uh, throughout the city. Uh, there are a series of amendments that the Baltimore City Administration has developed as a result of conversations with relevant stakeholders, including the judge who oversees the in-rem docket in Baltimore City, to ensure that the changes being requested can be implemented and will not slow the momentum we have built within the court system. I'll now introduce Dan Ellis, who is the co-chair of the Taxo Work Group, um, and after him, you'll hear from Joseph Kirshner with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dan Ellis. I'm the Executive Director of Neighborhood Housing Services of Baltimore, and I served as co-chair of Mayor Scott's Tax Sale Work Group that produced this bill. This bill really does two things. And what it does is it expands the number of properties that are eligible for NREM um, foreclosure to all tax delinquent properties that are vacant in the city, that are, have a vacant building notice in the city. So it expands it from the current law, which limits it to just those where the liens exceed the value of the property. And then the second thing it does is it establishes how compensation is then provided to the prior owner to avoid making it a taking of the property. And the way that a value is determined, there are two new ways that that can be done. The first is you can hold an auction of the property where the fair market value is determined by the highest bid at the auction. And the second option is to have an appraisal done. And the reason that that option is important is because if Baltimore City is trying to assemble properties for a larger project or work for a community directed outcome that the community has indicated as a priority, it allows for the appraisal to be done, which therefore establishes the fair market value. In 2019, this body passed the NREM current law of NREM, uh, which has been being implemented in Baltimore City now. 
The real benefits of the current system is it is much faster than the existing system, which I believe Mr. Kirshner will be addressing. And the city can control the outcome of what happens to the property at the end of the process, which allows for them to work with the community. This is a critical piece of legislation that really will stimulate redevelopment in communities around Baltimore City. And we request a favorable report on SB 855. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I'm up. Uh, okay, hi. there you go. Uh, my name is Joseph Kirshner, I'm the Managing Attorney at the Department of Housing and Community Development for Baltimore City, our development division, and we're the ones who are implementing uh, in-rem foreclosure. Um, as, as Mr. Ellis mentioned, we found so far, you know, it's, it's, we're still building our capacity and we're working through it, but what we found is that uh, the titles that we have acquired on these vacant uh, abandoned properties have taken about five months. Uh, through the court system, which is really lightning fast compared to, uh, say, tax sale foreclosure, which is was our old way of acquiring uh, vacant properties. Uh, this bill, I, th I think, does a couple things um, that we support. One, it's been mentioned, it expands uh, in-rem eligibility to nuisance properties. And nuisance properties are um, frequent code violations. They're uh, uh, their uh, blights on the neighborhood, they may not uh, currently qualify, but it's a good tool for us to have uh, to be able to use in REM to address those um, in addition to uh, standard code enforcement. Um, another thing uh, that I want to mention is that it expands the due process requirements uh, so that it protects the rights of all the interest holders. It uh, requires that we give notice in accordance with Maryland rules, which the existing law didn't do. Um, the city has gone ahead and done that, but this will kind of fill in that gap. And you know, we there are two reasons. Obviously, we want to protect the property rights of the interest holders, uh, and also we want a good title at the end of this. And um, you know, uh, requiring due, due uh, observation of due process rights gets us there. And then the last thing has already been mentioned. Uh, it provides for the distribution of excess proceeds, um, you know, and this is another way to protect the property rights, the the interest of the of the the rights of the interest holders, and make sure money is distributed in accordance with their interests. Thank you. Sure. Greetings, Vice Chair Rosa Pep and members of the committee. My name is Michael Higgs, and I am the director of the Maryland State Department of Assessments and Taxation. SDAT supports Baltimore City's strategy to use in-rem foreclosure to expedite the process of returning nuisance properties to, public, to productive use. This bill would make properties designated as nuisance by Baltimore City Building Code also subject to in-rem foreclosure and would permit the city to determine the lien threshold. Baltimore City often reports that vacant and nuisance properties regularly cycle through the tax sale process each year and have negative impacts on the community. This bill provides a potential solution for the issue. And for these reasons, SDAT urges a favorable vote on SB 855. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from members of the committee? Yes, Senator Benson. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, uh, blighted property in a community is heartburn. But the time that it takes for the city, or, or I know in, in in, in my particular case, I own some properties in a county, and it takes forever and a day for the for the for the property to something to be done to the property, you know. So the property sets; it's an eyesore. Uh, all kinds of problems are going on there. You you have the squatters who can move in, all kinds of stuff. Talk to me about the timeline for, for the property that you all are trying to work with. Does that cut back the time that? it takes to go into the courts to retrieve the property? Yeah, actually. Can you, can you talk to me about the process? Yes, sure. So currently, I mean, prior to NREM, in tax sale foreclosure, we had to, even when properties were upside down, vacant and upside down, we had to wait until the tax sale in order to get a certificate that, and then we, the city would become the certificate holder and could foreclose. But if there wasn't an existing tax sale certificate, we had to wait until the, ne the next tax sale so that the city would become the certificate holder and then we could foreclose on the property. Uh, so in-rem foreclosure does away with that requirement. We don't have to wait for a tax sale anymore. We can foreclose on the existing liens without a certificate. So that cuts a lot of time off. 
And then in addition, there's this differentiated court management, uh, docket management system set up uh, with the court that is shortening the amount of time it takes for us to foreclose on properties. So, and, and you know, recognizing that everybody has property rights, but this is an NREM action. So it's an action against the property. And therefore the court will allow us, if after making good faith efforts to get service on the owners and with abandoned property, that can be hard, but they'll allow us to rely on the publication and posting of the property as notice. And with abandoned properties, that's frequently what is needed in order for us to move forward. So sometimes it takes a long time because we're trying to find you know, the dead owners of defunct corporations that used to own the property or, you know, somebody with an interest, a ground rent interest who died, uh, you know, decades ago and we're trying to find uh, heirs. Uh, so in REM, uh, this in REM foreclosure process kind of hastens that. Um, and, uh, you know, we do uh, comply with Maryland rules. Uh, this legislation will require that. Um, but so we do, we are recognizing the due process rights, but we're moving it with, I think, deliberate and appropriate speed now. And it's like, while the timeline is moving up, it's still not quick enough. So if I could just give a face to what we're talking about. So in the four by four neighborhood, there are 700 plus homes, 200 plus are vacant. And what happens is when you live next to, so when the neighbor or my constituent calls me and says that my home is flooding because this house that's been abandoned right. is impacted, right. imagine not being able to do nothing about that for 16, 18 months. Imagine if the roof fell in, imagine if a tree's growing through the home. Imagine, so, so these challenges, because the folks have left them homes, nine months still isn't uh, quick enough. I've been, that's why I have the quarterly meetings. That's why I'm always talking to Joe because it's real people that's impacted because we have these long timelines about when things can get addressed in such a high concentration of vacant property within our city. So right now it's just available, it's just available in Baltimore, Baltimore City. There, there's, there's enabling legislation, I'm sorry, there's enabling legislation for, for the entire state, but for as I understand, state. Baltimore is the only jurisdiction that has adopted it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Senator Jackson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, for bringing this piece of legislation. Uh, as you know, Prince George County, one of my jurisdictions and my home, has 27 municipalities. So the question is, is MML um, a part of your favorable panel or have you all engaged MML or has the mayor's office already presented this dynamic program? I understand a little bit about the blighted properties and those matters having been the sheriff of a county and, and waiting on share sales and how long that takes. and and the things that go on in such properties. Uh, so I, I am uh, encouraged because there, there's still due process. Our system ensures that everyone is made whole uh, as um, uh, and, and with uh, due uh, and proper um, um, uh, efforts to deliver that. Uh, but I'm, I'm very much uh, interested in how the process speeds up once we get past that notification period. So I would uh, love to speak to you more about that. Uh, and, and if anyone has an answer regarding uh, MMLs uh, um, and MAKO's input to that, that, I'd appreciate that as well. So, so I don't believe that we sort them out, but they have been in a larger conversations that took place, I want to say 2019, 2020, when this first was uh, there. And the seat that you sit in at this moment, it was a young lady, Senator Eckert, and I knew that this just wasn't a city of Baltimore problem because she was super active within this process. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Senator Selling. Thank you. Thank you for this bill, Senator. And I know at times there's emergency situations that happen in these types of areas, like if you have a fire or you have, like they were stating, maybe water or electrical issues. I um, mean, is, is, is this for something like this to make sure we can move much faster or is there something already in place that we could do something like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so there are uh, standard code enforcement um, police powers that exist. Um, but I guess what this does is that's not an ultimate solution. That's not going to resolve the problem in the property. It's It can address an emergency. Yeah. Um, but what this does is take that title to the property. 
either prepare it to be uh, sold for redevelopment, right. or at least the city has control over the property rights to that. So they can shop the property, they can look for developers, um, they can communicate with commu uh, community organizations and try to find solutions, be it open space or redevelopment of the parcel oh. or, or the building itself. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions for this panel? I have a couple. Um, this sounds like what we did when we passed the first bill was really good and it's kind of working. That's pretty encouraging. Not all bills we pass work out that way. So <laughs> that's very good news. <laughs> the second thing, it sounds like what you're describing with the expansion, that it'll be even better, which is obviously why you brought in the bill. My question is, how scalable is this? I mean, very few have been done so far. I mean, can we get into the thousands and thousands and thousands? With this, with these tools, or do we need to do more? Um, I, I, it's my understanding that uh, the commissioner uh, of DHCD intends for us to be uh, filing hundreds of these cases every month. Uh, we're trying to ramp up now. We're working to hire new attorneys. Um, we have, you know, title work is an issue, right? Getting good uh, the title history to the property. So we just hired a new title attorney. Uh -huh. Um, and we are building uh, a, a database, an online tool that's really going to help us move stuff forward. So, you know, we only have 11 successes so far. You know, we filed uh, 35 cases, um, and that number's growing every week. We probably have 90 um, where we have either filed a case or we've ordered the title work. So we're in the process. Know, we're, getting, yeah. we're getting close to 100. And then we have already identified another 600 properties Great. that are priorities. Um, and so once we build out, we think this is going to be scalable. Um, that's that's terrific. It, it, other than giving you money, which we're not going to do, <laughs> um, is there anything else that we could do that could help you accelerate this process? Or you, 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 you've you thrown everything on the table in this bill and you'll come back to us another year if you need some more tools? Yeah, some of the frustrations, and Joe was being very um, nice, uh so in reference to like the title work so that would take my city several months to get the title work done to get the claim title to even get to the court process which was one of my frustrations i know that i reached out to the ceo at that time and said hey help me understand like what's taking so slow it was the dollar amount that we were paying uh the contractor to do the title work gotcha. and because we were in a very good season of a lot of houses selling. Gotcha. We weren't the priority from that from that standpoint. So like those are some of the the barriers. We have three groups, and I always tell folks to be very intentional. So like the, I keep bringing up the four by four, but we have Dolly Park, we have Berea, where these high concentration of homes. I don't think that you do this everywhere. I think that you have to be intentional about yeah. where you go about doing sure. it, and then move out and spread as you're successful. Yeah. We have a couple of community groups that have resources at this time that are just waiting to get the houses gotcha. from the city. Gotcha. Um, at this moment, I think that that's one of the issues. It's not my issue at the moment, but money becomes the issue. Money. At, 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 so what are you going to do with it once you got it? When yeah. it starts yeah. moving very fast. That makes, that yes, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, very, very much. Any other questions for this panel? Thank you. Uh, and we have a variety of other witnesses, and I, I think we have enough chairs that the other witnesses can come up to the table. And if you could uh, decide who's going to go first and introduce yourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi there. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Odette Ramos. I am the uh, councilwoman for the 14th district in Baltimore City. I have come before this committee before. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, in my former role uh, as the executive director of the Community Development Network, we worked hard with Senator Eckert and Delegate Holmes to put together the uh, bill that had passed, uh, which is the in-rem bill that is now um, in place. And I look forward to helping other jurisdictions uh, implement that. Um, we've already been in conversations with Prince George's and also with um, Dorchester County, which was the intent uh, of having both of them um, also sponsor the bill. Um, this particular expansion is extremely important. Um, again, the current bill, the current law is when the liens exceed the assessed value of a property that is vacant, 
then the city will foreclose. And you just heard my colleague from DHCD talk about how meteoric the time frame is based on the work that we've been doing with the court. And now we're asking for the expansion of this to when the liens are below the assessed value of the property so that we can reach more properties. Let me give you an example. In my district, I represent an amazing diverse district. I have two neighborhoods that have 450 properties together, uh, vacant properties together. 28% of them are ready for in-rem right now. They are on the list to get ready to go through the court and uh, go through in rem. An additional 35% of those properties would be counted under this bill, meaning that I could get an, a, an, a total of almost 65% of those vacant properties in those two neighborhoods together on a block by block basis so that we can work with community on the outcome of the property. This is a game changer for us. This is huge. So we need your help. We need you to pass this bill so that we can get permission to be able to do the work that we need to do in Baltimore City, um, scale it uh, just as the commissioner is working on, um, and, uh, and to do the job that we need to do, and, and remove decades and decades of um, you know, blight, uh, also to work in areas that have been traditionally ignored, um, so that we finally get a hold of and are able to repair the damage that has been done by um, disinvestment and redlining. Um, so I hope that you will support this. Thank you so, so much uh, for the opportunity to come before you today. Thank you. Perfect timing. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Christina Paglin-Allen and I am speaking in support of SB 855 on behalf of Baltimoreans United in Leadership Development. We are a broad-based, multi-faith, non-partisan coalition of over 35 religious congregations, nonprofits, and schools in Baltimore. And several other build leaders are here with me today in the blue t-shirts. Founded in 1977, we have a long track record of effectively acting on many, many issues, but we are here today because of the decades long crisis of abandoned and vacant homes and properties in Baltimore, which is my hometown where I live and serve. Over 70,000 properties, homes, and lots that are vacant, abandoned, or at risk of becoming so. As we know, this crisis is rooted in our city's long history of destructive and racially discriminatory housing policies and practices. The expansion of judicial in REM is a key part of, it's a key tool in solving our city's crisis as part of our whole block strategy that has proven effective in neighborhoods in East Baltimore where we have successfully revitalized neighborhoods, reducing vacancies by 85%. The homicide rate has been cut in half in these neighborhoods while restoring $50 million of wealth to nearby home owners, all without displacing a single resident or family. And you can read more details in the 113 page report, Whole Blocks, Whole City. My colleague, the Reverend Brent Brown, pastors um, in West Baltimore, and he's got nine vacant, uh, nine row homes across the street, eight of which are vacant for many, many years. Um, and I'm wrapping up right now. I'm wrapping up. Um, four of those um, are taken care of. Two of the existing vacants um, qualify for judicial in rem, but the other two do not, but would if this legislation were adopted. So this is key and we must act now. Thank you. Before you go, I just want to make a comment. Who knew that in rem could be so exciting? <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chairman Rosapep, <laughs> distinguished members of the committee. For the record, my name is Scott Poyer. I'm the elected clerk of the Circuit Court in Anne Arundel County, and I'm here today representing the um, Association of Circuit Court Clerks, which represents all the elected clerks in the state of Maryland, including Baltimore City Clerk Xavier Conaway. Um, 
Clerk Conaway asked me to step in today to uh, pass on his apologies. He did want to be here in person, but he had a family emergency come up. So he asked me to, uh, to attend today to call your attention to uh, the uh, specifically to the fiscal and policy note on page three, which says state expenditures, general fund expenditures may increase beginning as early as fiscal 2024 for additional staff and operating expenses for the clerk of the circuit court in Baltimore City to handle foreclosures filings under this bill. Any impact, however, cannot be reliably estimated at this time. Clerk Conway has filed written testimony, which speaks to the uh, implementation of this. I believe Clerk Conway does not want to become a roadblock to the implement implementation of this. Uh, but if you do scale this up and uh, Clerk Conway does not receive additional resources, it could result in significant, perhaps years long backlogs to actually implement the bill. So, um, Clerk Con I again pass on Clerk Conaway's uh, apologies for not being able to be here in person. I will answer any questions I'm able to answer. I'm pitch hitting today. So you're, you're doing a great job. You you do a great job at the Clerk of the Court in Anne Arundel oh. County. So thank you for, for joining us and really being here. I think you can ask, answer this question, which I should know the answer to. How are Clerks of the Court's offices financed? Where do you um, get your money? Through the state. Uh, we're um, uh, financed judiciary. And so um, the uh, legislature passes our budget. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Any questions for this panel? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other witnesses on this bill? If not, that concludes the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 885 and 855. And with that, Senator King is going to take the chair. Okay, next on our list this afternoon, we have Senate Bill 720. Who is doing that for the, uh, the chairman? Uh, the department can do it itself. Okay, welcome. Thank you very much. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the Budget and Tax Committee. Uh, for the record, Andrew Fulginiti with the Maryland Department of Labor, here to present Senate Bill 720. Uh, this is a sunset bill. So this bill would sunset, uh, extend the sunset extension for the Maryland Racing Commission under the Department of Labor, uh, the standard 10 years to July 1, 2034. Uh, the commission oversees the licensing of all individuals at the track. So from jockeys and trainers to the veterinarians, stable employees and track vendors themselves. Uh, other key uh, responsibilities of the commission include promoting the safety and welfare of the horses, participants, uh, as well as ensuring the running of the races are conducted in a fair and equitable manner. Uh, so I'll be brief with that. I'd ask the committee for a favorable report and be happy to answer any questions. Okay. I don't see any questions. Uh, it says we have one witness. That, that was you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you. Okay. Next, Senator Hayes, Senate Bill 826. You have four witnesses. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of Budget and Tax. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge and the guests who's joined me this afternoon, my pastor, uh, the Reverend Dr. Robert Turner of the Empowerment Temple AME. I share it with my committee, Senator Benson, that Reverend Turner came to us in, here in Baltimore at the Empowerment Temple AME just over a year ago. Um, he come by way of Tulsa, Oklahoma where he led marches to City Hall to um, give proper burials to those who were massacred during the uh, Tulsa race massacre. Um, since being here in the last six months, every once a month, every month for the last six months, he walked from Baltimore to Washington, D.C. every month um, in the name of reparations um, at our nation's capital. And so he's been an awesome leader and faith leader here in the state of Maryland. So just want to acknowledge his presence as he's here with me today with the GBC Leadership Committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of Budget and Tax Committee. I'm Senator Antonio Hayes from the 40th Legislative District here in Baltimore City for the record. 
Um, it's my honor to be here with you today to support my support for Senate Bill 826. Senate Bill 826 seeks to alter the application requirements for the homeowner's property tax credit, tax credit that provides valuable services to um, some of our most vulnerable citizens, our senior citizens, mostly in our communities. Specifically, the bill allows a qualified homeowner to file an application for the homeowner's property tax credit every third year after the year of the initial application for the property tax credit. In the years that a homeowner does not file an application, a homeowner must certify, certify to ESTAT that unspecified gross income information has not changed since the initial, initial application. A qualified homeowner is a homeowner whose gross income includes only income from any benefit under Social Security Act, a pension, or an annuity. This bill takes effect on June 1, 2023, and applies to taxable, uh, taxable years beginning June 30th, 2023. Um, there are some very interesting uh, notes here in the um, testimony that's provided. I'm glad that Estat was able to join me as well as our other panelists today. But this, this tax credit is often overburdensome to some of our most vulnerable and older citizens. And so we hope to alleviate, alleviate some of that burden by making it easier where they don't have to go about applying every year and get this valuable tax credit. Sometimes the property taxes that are owed to our local and state governments can really um, put someone, a homeowner, um, most of them who've owned their homes for greater 20, 30 years um, out of a place to live. And so, uh, we know that we, we share a vision in making sure that our most vulnerable citizens are protected. And so with that, Madam Chair, um, I urge a favorable report for Senate Bill 826. Thank you. Yes, okay, Allison Harris. I'm Allison Harris, Director of the Home Preservation Project at the Pro Bono Resource Center of Maryland. Today, I wanna to tell you the story of my client, Janet, to help you understand what happened to her and how the passage of SB 826 could have helped her and others in her situation. Failure to apply or reapply for the credit in a timely manner frequently lands families in tax sale. Janet would have been one of them, but for the fact she came across my desk as a client in one of our estate planning clinics and mentioned she had delinquent property taxes. She was worried about losing her home, which was her only asset to tax sale. Janet was 68. She'd owned her home for 22 years. She did not have a mortgage and her annual income was less than $15,000 due to social security and food stamps. She had had the homeowner's tax credit previously and relied on it to be able to afford her property tax bill. For some time now, she'd been going to a local outreach center to help her annually with her income taxes and her tax credit application. Last year, due to staffing issues, Janet's tax credit application was not submitted despite assurances from the outreach center that it would be taken care of. By then, the October 1st deadline to apply for the homeowner's property tax credit for her tax bill had passed. In December, Janet received a bill for $2,400. She was shocked because she had always received the credit previously, and that's the only way she could afford her home. She was panicked. I took the application to her house to complete, gathered her documentation, scanned and submitted the materials to SDAT with a desperate plea to grant her an exception to the deadline. Without reliable access to the internet or a copy machine, Janet would have had a hard time completing this herself, like many seniors. Thankfully, SDAP processed Janet's application and brought her bill down to zero. If Janet and others in her situation didn't have to apply annually, this could have been avoided. Allowing a three-year period between renewal of the credit would enable far more homeowners to pay their share of taxes and keep their homes. Thank you, Chair and Committee members, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Okay, um, Michael Higgs. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Michael Higgs for the record and I am the Department of Assessments and Taxation Director. Senate Bill 826 would reduce the amount of paperwork required that certain applicants need to submit to SDAT in order to receive the homeowner's tax credit. For applicants who continue to earn solely income solely from Social Security, a pension, or an annuity, and have met certain other requirements, the department will permit applicants to submit a mini application every second and third year. This bill will make the process less burdensome for our fixed income seniors and other qualified recipients, as well as add increased efficiency for SDAT. For these reasons, SDAT strongly urges a favorable vote on Senate Bill 826, and we thank the Senator for his hard work on this effort. Thank you. Lorna Henry? 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lorna Henry. I'm a staff attorney at Maryland Legal Aid. We appreciate the invitation given to us by Senator Hayes to testify on this very important bill. As the largest nonprofit law firm in Maryland, we serve each of the state's 24 jurisdictions, and we know how impactful this legislation would be to the residents in the state. This bill is so important because it helps people get the tax credit who need it the most. It makes the process easier, simpler, and less time consuming. This bill would benefit our elderly population, retirees and widows receiving social security, pensions, and annuities. Also low income and disabled people receiving SSI or SSDI. These are the clients Maryland Legal Aid serve. Every year we send out a letter with the application to remind our clients of the tax credit and we help them complete it. For some of them, the application is difficult and they never finish the process. For others who are on fixed income and don't have to file taxes every year, they sometimes forget to apply and so they never receive the credit. Requiring an application every three years is a good thing to do for homeowners and it also makes it easier for legal services organizations like Maryland Legal Aid because we don't have to take extra steps every year to ensure these vulnerable communities get the tax credit, which helps them avoid foreclosure and tax sale. This legislation would allow us to direct our resources in more targeted ways, which would not only benefit us as an organization, but also the other clients we're endeavoring to serve. This is a necessary and practical bill that makes it easier and simpler for our most vulnerable populations to get the tax credit each year. Missing just one year, could be the year that their property tax becomes too high to pay and they fall into foreclosure or tax sale and lose their home. We want to avoid that from happening if possible. Maryland Legal Aid strongly supports passage of this bill and we ask that you give it a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Is Jonathan Glazer here? He's not. He's okay, not. Senator Heidelman, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this is brilliant. I wish I would have thought of it. Um, you be the mm -hmm. so, I love this bill. Um, I, I guess the question is for SDOT. Um, it says here in the fiscal note that 45,000 individuals receive the property tax each year. I, it's my understanding that thousands more are potentially eligible for it, but don't make use of it. Yes, ma'am. So if you could talk about that one and two of those 45,000 people, how many do you think can avail themselves of this? So I don't have a number on how many would be eligible out of that 45,000, but we can research that and get back to you. Uh, with regards to the first part of your question, we do significant outreach every year for the homeowner's tax credit. We, uh, we take our records of who is potentially eligible for the, the tax credit, who owns their home, um, and then we cross-reference against the comptroller's uh, income data, from, from uh, the tax returns, and then we come up with a list of who qualifies for this potentially, and then we send them out a postcard every year. I believe we sent out 125,000, give or take, postcards in the past, uh, over the past couple of years, each year. Sure. Um, so we are, uh, and then we speak to community groups, and, and we do everything that we can to try to uh, promote um, the, the tax credits that we offer and make sure that everyone who, who is eligible applies. And we also want to make a, a, applying as easy as possible. So we're in the process of putting uh, the application online uh, so that everyone will be able to, to file online. Our renter's application just went live online uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that was very exciting news for Estat. And our homeowner's application uh, should be online this time next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Senator Carter, Senate Bill 766. Good afternoon. This is my first time appearing before the full committee. We'll go easy on you. <laughs> I'm used to the grilling. Um, I'm Senator Carter, and I have a bill that is on behalf of the Baltimore City Administration. And um, you already have Dan Ellis, I've got, or I may, oh, Nina Themelis, Nicole Hart, or whoever the city so chooses to bring. Um, this is a really wonderful bill for residents, homeowners in Baltimore City, and it just very simply would um, help homeowners stay in their homes when they come across hardship when it comes to the tax sale. It's the result of a a task force um, to look at our tax sale system and figure out how to make it work for the people better. 
And so the bill basically would extend the period of time um, that a, from the time that the house is up for tax sale um, from six months to three years, and it would allow for a process where um, the city would work with that homeowner so they would not have to lose their home and it would expand the number of attempts um, to work with the homeowner, to contact the homeowner, I and mean, basically um, help keep some of our abandoned houses off of the block, um, abandoned housing list, and um, keep people in their homes. I think it's a wonderful bill. I'll let you hear from the city, and I'll be, I'll stay to answer any questions along with them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have Odette uh, Ramos. That's all right. We'll take this panel first. Okay. Um, Nina Themelis. Yeah. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Nina Themelis, Interim Director of the Mayor's Office of Government Relations, here to testify in support of SB 766. This legislation is the result of the convening of the tax sale work group, which was established by Mayor Scott in the fall of 2021. Uh, this is one of three pieces of legislation that was introduced as a result of the work of that um, tax sale work group um, this year. Uh, this bill seeks to allow for alternative pathways uh, for residents who find their homes being placed on the tax sale list and also allows for the mayor and city council to cancel the tax sale altogether. One thing that the legislation would establish is a payment plan for residents who have been unable to pay property taxes and other lienable fines and fees and have their property removed from tax sale while they make these payments. This bill would allow for Baltimore City to create its own tax and lien collection system and not have to use a traditional tax sale system. This bill is essential for keeping our most vulnerable homeowners residing in and owning their homes. Homeowners receiving final bill and legal notices have very limited time to react and settle to avoid tax sale within the system as it works currently. This bill would potentially take owner-occupied properties out of tax sale and give owners additional time to pay bills in arrears with payment plans. Currently, the city only offers payment plans uh, for future bills. This bill also creates a new section for in-rem foreclosure for residential property that would not only uh, that would not likely interfere with the current in-rem foreclosure process on vacant lots and buildings. Um, finally, this extensive set of parameters for contacting property owners, um, as outlined in the bill, uh, deliberately ensure that the property owner has every opportunity to opt to participate in the payment plan process. The passage of SB 766 would provide for a more effective remedy to assist homeowners in avoiding tax sale and understanding and navigating the tax sale process. Uh, we have the tax sale work group co-chair Dan Ellis here um, and Nicole Hark from the Department of Housing and Community Development to testify in support of this bill as well. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Alfred, you have a question. You, Madam Chair, and I apologize, I have to step out okay. for a quick 4 p.m. So I wanted to ask a question now. And I'm not Senator Eckert in terms of my understanding of, of tax sale policy. Do you, Nina, do you not have any of the flexibility you just mentioned? You currently do not have the ability to enter into a payment plan with folks. You that is correct. Because um, some of those payments are tied to state level property taxes, we cannot okay. um, go into payment plans with anything that's in arrears. That's helpful to know. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, Michael Higgs, you wanna go next? Yes, ma'am, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, my name is Michael Higgs. Uh, I am Director of the Maryland State Department of Assessments and Taxation. The department supports Baltimore City's strategy to provide more tools to residential property owners that are in arrears on their taxes. Through the agency's Office of the Tax Sale Ombudsman, SDAT works every day to assist Baltimore City's residents in navigating the tax sale system by providing the best information, assistance, and resources available. This bill would establish a program to divert residential property from the private tax, sale le tax lien sale process into an alternative program for the payment of taxes that are in arrears. For these reasons, ASTAT urges a favorable vote on Senate Bill 766. Thank you. Nicole Hart? No, not yet. She, she's here. She's. You want to finish the panel or you want to? We'll finish the panel. Let's just go along the panel, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the uh, committee. My name is Dan Ellis. I am the Executive Director of Neighborhood Housing Services of Baltimore, and I served have served as co-chair of Mayor Scott's Tax Sale Work Group. Re when we were charged with the mayor of as a work group, we were asked to create an equitable system of tax sale collection for Baltimore City. There are three, three bills that came out of that work. The first was heard a few minutes ago. This is the second. The third has gone through judiciary last week. Um, the, the goal for occupied properties is to create a system that is easy to make payments and that is affordable for the property owner to be able to maintain their property. And the key thing that we found in research of what's best practices around the country is that payment plans that are affordable to the owners is critical. It, it has been authorized in many cases, but not all cases. And this bill says you can do it at any time. 
which is critical. The second thing that's critical is outreach. If you're working with property owners, we want to reach them and make sure that we're being proactive in that. This bill requires 10 outreach attempts, which could be by mail, by phone, or by visiting the property to a, over a course of three years, which gives support to the homeowners or the property owners, because it's all occupied property, to be able to move through the process. And then the third thing it does is it gives the mayor the authority to cancel the tax sale. And that's important because right now the city of Baltimore is required to have a tax sale every, every fiscal year. And so as we put in a new system, it's important to have that flexibility. Some have suggested that, that this should be limited only to owner occupied properties. That does not serve to meet the needs of all residents of Baltimore, which we were tasked with doing. There are a lot of residents in Baltimore who may own one or two rental properties that allows them to then be able to earn income and revenue. And if someone stops paying it often, they can become behind on their bills. It's also been suggested to do a pilot program that can be done under this legislation because it is enabling. And so we ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 766. Thank you Thank very you. much. Who's next? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lorna Henry. I am a staff attorney at Maryland Legal Aid, and we appreciate the invitation given to us by Senator Carter to testify on this bill. You have my written testimony, so I just have a few things to share. Um, it is very important we help low-income and vulnerable communities stay in their homes. The consequences of facing a tax sale are severe. The minimum threshold amount of unpaid taxes on a residential property that will cause the city to put the property in a tax sale is currently $750 for owner-occupied properties. A person could have thousands of equity in their home, and for them to lose it due to a $750 property tax bill could result in housing loss for not only the homeowner, but their children or grandchildren or elder parents who are often living in the home with them as well. There are a lot of good parts to this legislation. One of several significant aspects that I'm going to highlight is the establishment of the payment plan. Um, some of Maryland Legal Aid's clients are ordinary homeowners um, and one major life event like an unexpected surgery or caring for grandparents or grandchildren can cause them to have a financial hardship, which makes it difficult for them to pay their property taxes in a given year. This bill would be vital in helping these these homeowners remain in their homes. Additionally, there is currently financial assistance available through the Homeowner Assistance Fund administered through the Department of Housing and Community Development. And as of today, there is over $100 million left of the $190 million that was allocated for housing assistance. Um, it takes time and it's taking time and months and months and months for applicants to get this assistance. And this bill would help give those applicants more time to get this assistance. This bill offers very practical steps toward reducing housing loss in Maryland. Maryland Legal Aid strongly supports this passage and urges a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's all for this panel. Correct. Okay, so... Senator Jackson. Yes, ma'am. A couple of questions. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to the uh, gentleman who just spoke prior to, um, a quick question for you. I didn't catch all of what you said. You talked about the tax sales that are annual. The annual tax sale, you said it gives the mayor's office flexibility on tax sales. Expound on that. So the mayor's office right now is obligated to hold a tax sale every year. This bill would mean that they, the mayor can cancel the tax sale. And that's important because the tax sale, as we currently know it, if we implement this bill, you'd have the authority to use the NREM process at, at, with this bill as well for occupied properties after the three years of outreach. And so there may not be a need for the current system, which were required by law to hold. So it just allows the mayor to choose to cancel that. Does that does that make sense? Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and then to the um, uh, Maryland Leeway. So, if the tax sale is canceled, as you're trying to, so first of all, I guess I need to understand some of your communication efforts that are going to these homeowners, right? So you're there to assist the homeowners. Just talk to me about the communication efforts to those homeowners. Well, for Maryland Legal Aid, we're more so reacting to a problem that has already Understood. developed. So for us, um, we don't we don't we don't really have an opportunity 
to prevent the the um, the initial point at which a tax sale occurs, they normally contact us for legal assistance after being notified of a tax sale. And so we're you know we're trying to you know give them all of the help and resources that they need as well as the legal assistance by representing them in their tax sale case. This bill would be helpful because the point that I that, that I highlighted was the establishment of the payment program. It's not okay. like they don't want to pay. They need time to pay. No, I, I certainly understand it. I'm, I'm just trying to get the gist of, uh, and we want to help folks. And um, again, I've been on the other side of that. Um, but how do we communicate to the homeowners uh, that there are um, uh, dollars available to help you? And what is the city doing to do that? Oh, what is the city doing? So there are a number of things that are in the design system, in the system that's designed. It's designed to be both phone outreach when we have a phone number that we can reach, posting the property. So someone going out to the property, knocking on the door, leaving some information at the property. It is mailings. It's trying to hit multiple ways of reaching people. Um, it's mailing if there's a address on record, like with Estat, that we can reach out to that address. Um, or any contact information, but it's really trying to identify the owner of the property to get them information so that they can get in. And the information that's going out is about assistance programs as applicable and uh, the supports that the opportunity to enter into payment plans and other such uh, supports that could be available. Okay, last, last question, Madam Chair. So I, I think oftentimes when notifications are placed on doors or folks are making contact, or trying to make contact and you're coming from a government entity or, or an entity that could actually take my property or or I owe. Uh, sometimes I'm, I just want to know if there's any other methodology that you're using yeah. in addition to that, because if I'm not going to open up the first thing, I'm not going to open up the second thing. So the, so the part of what we're trying to also do is the city has the option of partnering with some local nonprofits and community groups to gotcha. do outreach around it. It's about putting out the word in as many ways as we can. Uh, did you? And I also believe, and I can follow up with the committee um, afterward, but I believe there is a required public notice for the properties that are listed for tax sale. So if we're not able to connect with a person individually, individually, all of the properties that would be going up for tax sale that year would be listed in a in a local um, yeah, publication. I, I do understand that part. I, I guess what I'm trying to convey is, you know, I, I applaud you all for what you're doing. I think it's the, it's the right thing to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, folks who find themselves in need uh, kind of become, uh, you know, you can become a recluse during that period of time. And again, if I'm seeing something coming from the city and I have a home that I could possibly lose, I probably am not going to open up that, that piece of documentation. So uh, the community organizations that you're working with, the folks that are on the ground, uh, you know, I, I would love to... Uh, um, hear about that later, Senator Carter. Thank you. Understood. Okay, next panel, Odette Ramos, Nicole Hart, Jonathan Glazer, and Margaret Henn. Jonathan Glazer was just for backup in case I was stuck across the street. Okay, Margaret thank you. Across. Margaret's across the street. <laughs> okay, it's getting better and better here. <laughs> Hi, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Again, my name is Odette Ramos. I am the city councilwoman representing the 14th district in Baltimore City. Uh, I've been before you uh, in my previous role uh, regarding tax sale reform. Um, in 2017, uh, this body created a uh, tax sale working group um, that came up with several recommendations. Uh, in REM for vacant properties was one of them, but really only chipped away at trying to uh, reform a tax sale system. As you know, tax sale is when um, somebody can't pay their taxes uh, and the lien is put up for sale, uh, well, put up for auction, and then um, a third party uh, buys the lien, purchases the lien, and then and goes to uh, the homeowner to try to collect. Um, and in the rest of the state, it's 18% interest. In Baltimore City, it's 12% interest. And it's a system that, you know, people end up uh, paying the, the tax sale purchaser um, and uh, often have to make choices between um, eating, uh, paying for medications, um, or paying their taxes to try to save their home. 
this is an unjust system. And in Baltimore, we want to change it. Uh, we have new leadership, thanks to the leadership of Mayor Scott. Uh, we also have new leadership here at the state level. Um, and so we are no longer chipping away at trying to reform tax sale. This bill allows Baltimore City to wholesale have a new tax collection system that does not involve third parties. We want to be the ones working with our residents uh, to be able to help them pay their taxes with payment plans, uh, with uh, as much support as we can. The only time that we would use any other method is if we cannot make that connection or that person is refusing. This is the very last resort. Um, we will not be increasing uh, fees on them. We will not be increasing citations, anything like that. We are just simply trying to help them uh, pay their taxes. And that's why we need this particular bill. And I hope you will help us. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Okay, Nicole Hart. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Nicole Hart, Deputy Commissioner, DHCD, Baltimore City. Uh, I am here also uh, to uh, recommend that the, uh, the Senate supports Bill 766. Uh, and I also reiterate everything that my colleagues have already said. Uh, but I am also here to answer any questions from the vantage point of Baltimore City DHCD, if needed. Okay, thank you. Senator Jackson. My, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I can repeat it if I like. So could you sure. tell me about your communication efforts sure. to the families that are in these areas? And maybe you do it preventively versus when a challenge comes. Absolutely. So um, the tax sale, Baltimore City has a tax sale ombudsman, which sits in my department. And we work um, along with the, our office on aging as well. And what we look at, uh, our legacy homeowners. So we know by the records, um, people who've been in those homes for a certain period of time, right. and we do a strategic outreach. Uh, we actually use postcards um, as opposed to someone having to open a letter. Um, and those postcards go out um, once we know what the tax sale list looks like. And we do that every year so that we can be proactive in reaching out to people to say, hey, your, your, your property is coming up because we often get those same people afterwards where we're helping them try to untangle the process after their, you know, their tax sale lien has been sold. So we, we try vigorously during that time period. We also do outreaches. So we go uh, throughout the city and do outreach with the community groups on um, tax sale education and things of that nature um, and what's available to help prevent or to help remove, remove themselves from that tax sale list. Uh, also, um, we have what's called the tax sale deferral program, which it helps people get off the list, but it doesn't remove the debt. So in this particular situation, it would work with the debt. So we, we have the mechanism in place, which is, you know, that's a process within itself that can help them get off the list, but they have to go through a whole application process, get off the list, but that debt is still sitting there collecting. So the payment plan would actually help them remove the debt and work on paying that debt down. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilwoman. I just wanted to add a on second. The, we're, we're, we've got still got a bunch to go here yet. Absolutely. Uh, also on the communication side, at least in Baltimore City, um, we've been working, all of our council members have been trained on the outreach as well. And, you know, getting the right trusted person to knock on that door. It may not be the council person, but it may be a neighbor or maybe somebody else. So uh, we're, we've got all those methods that we're continuing to work through now and we'll just accelerate them uh, during the, during the, um, the, you know, putting this together. Um, and just last piece is um, we are asking for a favorable report on this bill with no amendments. Um, I think that's a critical piece. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. My question was answered. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. We have one virtual person left um, in favor. Uh, Allison Harris, do you want to go ahead? Hi, I'm Allison Harris, Director of the Home Preservation Project at the Pro Bono Resource Center of Maryland, a legal services provider in Baltimore. I also send postcards to all of the homeowners on the tax sale list, letting them know about resources available to them. Today, I want to tell you about the homeowners. 
My client, John, is a typical example of a homeowner in tax sale. John is a senior. He's owned his home for over 30 years, paid off his mortgage, paid his property taxes on time every year for decades until he retired and became reliant on Social Security. Like many senior homeowners, his property taxes increased dramatically over the decades, and then suddenly his income was reduced significantly. The lien certificate to his house was sold in a tax sale auction, and in his desperate attempt to save his home, John went door to door in his neighborhood offering to trim trees and do yard Hard work for cash. He scrimped by eating sandwiches out of a dumpster. We did save his home through a combination of homeowner assistance fund grants and tax credits, but he kept asking me if there was a way he could pay more than the tax limit at that set for him because he truly wants to be a good resident and taxpayer. Next, the Mendez family, another family I helped. Their lien was sold at tax sale for a few hundred dollars. The Mendez family had tried to pay off the bill by wire transfer from their bank, but unbeknownst to them, it didn't go through. In the meantime, they were unaware of the tax sale proceeding and continued to pay their property tax bills on time. They're of limited English proficiency and they didn't understand the city and court notices that came to their house. The home went through the foreclosure process. A judgment was issued against them. The lien purchaser auctioned the home to an individual investor from Texas. One day, a man from Texas shows up at their home, tells the Mendez family he's the new owner, but they could stay in it and rent it for him. So now the Mendez home and the equity they worked to build for these years is lost. A man from Texas, who has no particular interest in Baltimore, no interest in the neighborhood, no interest in the community, now owns that home. Last year, when Mayor Scott pulled owner-occupied properties from tax sale, I called all of my clients right away to tell them they got a reprieve. They cried, they sobbed, they shouted. The relief was palpable. They want to resolve their situations. They need more help. This is who we're talking about when we're talking about this legislation. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Okay. On the unfavorable side now, we have uh, Frank Boston, Ari Plott, and Heidi Kenny. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Frank Boston. I'm here today on behalf of the Kenny Law Group, uh, and we respectfully oppose this bill. Um, I'll start off by saying, how can the city of Baltimore collect these delinquent tax sales when they can't even process lien sheets? This bill hurts in an industry that has been a partner with the city forever. Uh, it hurts in the industry that works with homeowners to keep their homes. It, it hurts an industry that rehabilitates vacant and abandoned housing. There's an old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. For those reasons, we ask for an unfavorable. Yep. Okay, who's next? Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Heidi Kenny. I'm an attorney that practices in tax sale foreclosure. And I was also served on the state tax sale task force, as well as Brandon Scott's tax sale task force. This bill applies to all residential property, not homeowner occupied property, but all residential property and disincentivizes people from paying their taxes. It essentially gives them five years not to pay. And the message of this bill is if you live in Baltimore city, you don't have to pay your taxes. The hidden caveat of this in rem procedure that you heard testimony, and not only on this bill, but on the previous bill, is that it is an exorbitant amount of costs that get paid by the municipality, not by tax sale investors, which the history of tax sale is that these properties are sold to third parties so that the burden of the cost is placed on them and not on the government. Not additional to that is that in rem proceedings result in two foreclosures against a property owner. The first done by the government and the second by the purchaser of that property when they have to file a quiet title action because the government hasn't properly served or notify all the parties and the quiet title action has to put to rest the title deficiencies. For those reasons, I'm asking for an unfavorable report. There is already a current carve out in the city legislature for vulnerable homeowners and legacy homeowners and the protection for against tax sale. There's no point to this bill. Again, it's applying to all residential properties, not homeowner occupied. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ari Plout and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Tax Sale Participants Association in opposition to Senate Bill 766. <laughs> 
We're an industry of tax sale investors and lawyers that represent these investors. Uh, we're very concerned with this bill. As Frank, st Mr. Boston stated, we have had a strong relationship with Baltimore City. And through this partnership, we've helped keep the city afloat financially. Um, the city has essentially relied on us to collect their taxes. We anticipate that this bill will be costly and time consuming if Baltimore City decides to enact what the bill is authorizing, which is the intent of the legislation. This bill will essentially result in the city taking over the duties and practices of what our industry currently practices, such as collection and foreclosure proceedings. We fear the city is not equipped to handle this. In addition to installment programs created by the bill, the bill will remove residences from the tax sale and place into alternative programs. And this is on page three, line 17. It's un unclear what kind of program an alternative program is. For example, you go further down on page on lines 19 to 20, and out, it would they conduct outreach property owners to assist property owners to pay their taxes. So is this saying that the city is essentially going to start paying other people's taxes? Um, and lastly, I'll state, if the, if the purpose of the bill is to protect home, homeowners, then we would just kindly ask for an amendment to restrict, limit the bill strictly to homeowner-occupied properties. Um, and you, I believe there are other members you'll hear from the industry on this issue, but with that, we urge an unfavorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and we're now going to the virtual um, unfavorables. Scott Morris? Okay, and you are, sir? Okay, come on up. I don't see him on the list here, but it's okay. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Eskenazi. I am a tax sale investor, licensed real estate agent, and eight-year resident of Baltimore City. I oppose SB 766 and wish to see it amended. Proponents of this bill want to save owner-occupants from losing their properties to tax sale. I agree with this goal. Numerous reforms have been enacted in recent years to this effect, and more should be done, like offering owner-occupant tax sale payment plans. The truth, however, is historically of the 15 to 20,000 properties advertised for tax sale annually, only 15 to 20 owner-occupied properties would be lost to foreclosure, 0.1%. And for two years now, most owner-occupied properties have been removed from tax sale altogether, virtually eliminating this tiny risk. The current tax lien system is an excellent revenue collection tool, enabling 98% collection rate for city property taxes. Our goal should be to make owner-occupant protections permanent while protecting the excellent tax sale revenue the current tax sale system provides. This can be done by amending SB 766 so that in rem system it, so that the in rem system it creates applies exclusively to owner occupied properties rather than to all residential properties shouldn't non owner occupants investors business owners or derelict property owners be expected to pay their taxes property taxes are a major source of general fund revenue almost 53% in fiscal year 2021 Enabling non-owner occupants to evade property taxes for three years under this bill will be detrimental to vulnerable Baltimore residents who rely on property tax funded city programs and services. According to DPW testimony, delinquent water collections decreased substantially after water bills were removed from tax sale. The reason is obvious. Tax sale prompts people to pay. If SB 766 cancels tax sale, it's devastating to Baltimore property right. tax collection, we can protect owner occupants and city property tax revenue at the same time. All it would take is amending the bill so it applies exclusively to owner occupied properties. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Thanks very much. Okay, let's go to the virtual here. Scott Morris, sorry to make you wait. No problem. Let me unmute myself. Uh, thank you for your time today. My name is Scott Morris. I'm a tax sale foreclosure attorney. I've been doing tax sale foreclosures in volume for over 20 years, and I'm a large volume filer in Baltimore City. As uh, many of you senators may know, this interim um, idea for the entire SAC tax sale was brought up four years ago and shot down. It's an idea from a large think, uh, a think tank group that tried to push this idea across the country. At the time, four years ago, the city director of finance, the city administration, Maryland Association of Counties were all against this in-rem idea for all of tax sale. You've heard a lot about protecting homeowner occupants, but again, this bill has little to do with homeowner occupants. 
Besides the hyperbole being pushed, the real facts are that only 5% of the properties advertised for tax sale that are sold to private investors are homeowner occupied properties. And as already been stated, the mayor has removed homeowner occupied properties from tax sale. Only 3% of the filed foreclosures actually go all the way through uh, to ownership by the tax lien investor. The bottom line here is tax sale is a revenue tool and has little to do with homeowner occupants or vacancy. Based on the revenue from the city on the annual tax sale every year, if this bill passes, there will now be a three-year rolling tax delinquency of $160 million due to payment delays. This is not good. The city can't handle this. This will also affect state tax revenue. If you want to protect the homeowner occupants, as Mr. Eskenazi said, then remove the remaining 5% that are in the sale, but don't destroy the revenue stream that our clients provide to the city in an annual check. The current bill destroys this revenue stream. There can be a win-win if the proposed amendments go through, but if the bill leave, is left as amended and, and income and revenue fall off a cliff, it's gonna be a big problem. The bulk of the tax sale is non-homeowner occupied properties, and those bills should be paid every year in the current system that's worked well for Baltimore City. Homeowner occupants are protected. I urge an unfavorable report on the bill and the committee to look at the amendments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Adam Spritz. Good afternoon. I'm a member of the Maryland Tax Sale Participants Association. There have been significant changes to the tax sale system since 2015, about 15 changes that directly impact homeowner occupants, such as the removal of water bills from tax sale and in 2020 allowed installment pay payments for city property taxes. I can continue, but I'll use up all my time. 2021 data showed that 94.3% of the entire tax sale equaled non-homeowner properties advertised for sale. In addition, in 2022, all homeowner properties were removed from the tax sale. Please note that the majority of all properties pay Baltimore City before the tax sale even happens, and then another majority pay the city right after the tax sale. A letter dated August 26, 2020 from the Office of Bureau Budget and Management Research for the City of Baltimore opposed the same design of legislation. You've been provided a copy and uploaded testimony. Please additionally review the extensive material that has been provided to you, including the past testimony from the previous Director of Finance and staff regarding related issues. We have meaningful amendments that our group would like to add to this bill. In addition, I strongly believe that the Office of Finance and Budget should weigh back in with their opinion and provide you the updated, true, accurate, and non-political data points that they have. Elected officials and Baltimore City's Office of Finance and Budget have a fiduciary responsibility to the citizens of Baltimore City. Please consider all of the consequences. Please review the data. Please request updated data from finance and budget departments that you may not have been provided, the data speaks for itself. I strongly oppose this bill without having amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anthony Anwanibi, did I say that right? Yes, you did. Uh, uh, good afternoon, and, and thanks for taking uh, my uh, appearance here. Um, I'm, my name is Anthony Anwanibi. I'm an attorney in Baltimore City, and I've been an attorney for about 25 years working in the tax sale area. And uh, most of my clients are the small mom and pop clients. That's the people that go to the city and say, hey, uh, there's a vacant property near my, uh, next to me and there's blights in, in the vacant property. And what they do is uh, they, uh, the city tells them, OK, well, we can't do anything about it. But one of the options you have is to actually go and buy the tax lien, actually buy the tax lien and foreclose. So they buy the tax lien and bring it to my office to foreclose on the tax lien. And then they bring the property back into productive use. I have, over the 25 years, I have had a lot of uh, these uh, kind of clients, these mom and pop clients that are, and also where there's been investment groups, where there's been also, uh, uh, responsible, responsible community groups have uh, I've had as clients that have actually done a lot of work uh, with the community. So uh, this is all through the tax sale. So one of the things, uh, 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 and we're proposing is that this bill, uh, there could be an amendment. There's uh, clearly uh, the uh, 
over the past 25 years, I can count there probably less than a dozen <laughs> of homeowners that have actually lost their properties. And I've done three, 400 a year for almost 25 years. So it's, it's a very minuscule part of homeowners that lose their properties itself. And most, as you've heard the testimony, most of the properties that actually um, are foreclosed on impact sales are not homeowner properties. So I um, ask for an unfavorable on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Matthew Shelberg. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Shelberg. I urge you to vote no on this bill. I've worked in Baltimore City for 10 years, renovating distressed properties. I've spoken with hundreds of families in tax sale, and I've gone through tax sale myself. The number one problem with this bill is that it removes all residential property from tax sale, not just the owner occupants. This includes all investor properties, all rentals, multifamily apartment buildings, and flips under construction. These investors do not need relief. We do not need a landlord bailout in this bill. If the city offers us three years to pay before they take action, many investors will take every bit of rope that you give them. This will hurt the taxpayer and will cause more blight in our communities as problem properties rot for three years instead of the normal one year. Do not give investors a pass on paying their taxes. Second, this is a radical change to property tax collection, a $1 billion revenue source for Baltimore City. I hope that you'll consider the second and third order effects of this bill given what we already know about city water collection and other relief programs, including PPP loans and eviction prevention. The consequences are always bigger than we expect. So we need to ask tough questions. How will it affect the behavior of the taxpayers who currently pay their bills on time? How many property owners are expected to request payment plans? Does the city's track record suggest they can properly administer this type of massive program? We are taking on huge risk for very limited benefit. We can protect owner occupants using existing tools without putting the city budget at risk. I urge you to vote no on this bill so that Baltimore City is not here before you in five years asking for a bailout. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aaron Naiman. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Aaron Naiman. Like a few other members that testified prior to me, Ms. Kenny, <laughs> Councilwoman Ramos, Mr. Ellis, I also served on the statewide task force back in 2017 and 2018. Uh, Councilwoman Ramos is correct. We chipped away and made tax sale better. There were colleagues from both sides of the aisle that said, we have to come together. We have to protect the owner occupants. And that is what we did. Furthermore, speaking with Mayor Scott last year, when he informed us that he was gonna be pulling the owner occupants out, he didn't get a fight from us. We all want to protect owner occupants. What we don't want to do is see Baltimore City take a huge loss in revenue income. Now, tax sale itself, as I'm sure you've heard, produces tens of millions of dollars on one day in May. Besides that, in the months leading up to tax sale, tens of millions of dollars of property taxes are paid just because of the threat of tax sale leaning over people. Those letters that Baltimore City sends out in March causes thousands of properties, tens of thousands of properties to have their taxes paid. Now, when cases are actually filed, hundreds of thousands of dollars are paid to the court in court fees. We heard earlier testimony from um, Mr. Conway, the court clerk. He doesn't know how they're going to handle this. There was testimony earlier that if Baltimore City wants to start handling these cases for in rem, they could barely handle 90 in a year. Our offices, my office handles at least 300, 400 of them. You heard that people couldn't get title work back for months. We got title work back in 24 hours. Tax sale is a necessary revenue collection tool. Baltimore City has condemnations. They have receiverships. They, they refuse to acknowledge that they own thousands of tax sale certificates that they could be prosecuting. And they don't. They choose not to. Baltimore City, as much as I love my city, I'm a fifth generation Baltimorean, my grandmother was raised here. Baltimore City needs the income that tax sale generates. I urge you to vote unfavorable. Thank you. Okay, there's not a virtual one. Okay. Okay, that ends the hearing for this bill. Thank you. Okay, Senator Ellis, you've got a bill, uh, Senate Bill 510. Okay. 
Thank you, Chair King and uh, members of the Budget Committee. Uh, Arthur Ellis here from District 28 to present uh, Senate Bill 510, Minority Business Enterprise and Veteran Owned Business uh, Scorecard. And so I was informed that uh, virtual witness uh, was when to testify, had to get on an airplane and oh. they took off so they won't be able to join okay. us. So uh, just um, I'll present the bill. I think I'm solo today. So I- uh, We'll give you extra credit for being solo. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> so um, this bill is to require the governor's office of the small minority and women-owned affairs minus women business affairs to develop a scorecard to evaluate units of state government and how they do when it comes to um, achieving their goals to WMBE and federal owned businesses, uh, um, minority participation rates. And so it's similar to what the uh, Board of Education require of the school systems uh, throughout Maryland, there is a grade assigned based on performance. So we're looking at uh, a grade. It's basically a simple concept. A grade given to an agency that achieved 90% or more of the applicable goal. Um, B goes to folks who agencies that do between 80 and 89%. C grades for 70 to 79% and uh, below 70% a F. So working with the uh, Office of uh, Governor's Office of Small Minority Women-Owned Businesses, um, we talked about several agencies, very small agencies, who would all automatically receive a lower score because they're so small and uh, the numbers would not add up. So they are submitting a um, recommended amendment to uh, exempt uh, those small agencies from this uh, scorecard. So basically a simple concept, and we would love to uh, get a favorable report on Senate Bill 510. Thank good you, job. Chair, Any questions, comments? No, you're good. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. Okay, Senator Washington, good. Senate Bill 818. Perfect. Would love thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Get a favorable report on Senate Bill Five. The echo here. You still speaking, man? <laughs> Let me know you when you want me to start, Madam Chair. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, for the record, State State Senator Alonzo Washington. Uh, <laughs> had to catch myself there. Uh, to present on Senate Bill 818. Uh, for the record, all of my witnesses uh, today are all virtual as they all are uh, either school employees or they're, um, they're with their teams. Um, this bill is a very simple bill uh, for me and, and for places in Prince George County. I'm a former student athlete. I ran track and played football. Um, this is simple that I go to multiple schools in my district and all the fields are terrible. Um, people that, from the fields that I played on back in 2002, they're still the exact same as they are as they were back then. Um, the bleachers are the same. The lights are the same. The scoreboards the same. And we're not really investing um, in our student athletes uh, here in Maryland. Um, there's 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 currently no source of real funding for our students to for us to upgrade and renovate these uh, these um, uh, stadiums um, that are in much needed repair. Um, I know that there is multiple school jurisdictions that uh, that have seen uh, or experienced the same thing in different counties, and I'll go through that. Um, as you know, we have a lot of great athletes um, here in the state of Maryland. Um, we have over 112,000 athletes currently um, in our school system right now, in our public school systems. Let me make, let me make that clear. In our public school system, because most times we would fund we fund a lot of these other um, 
I don't want to say th these other schools that aren't necessarily public schools, um, but we don't really fund um, particularly our uh, high schools. Um, so this bill here will ask, will 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 allocate about just a little little bit of money, which is about fifty million dollars a year. <laughs> Uh, just a little we'll bit. Write, we'll write you a check. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it will, it will, this bill will create a public school stadium construction fund with uh, $50 million uh, allocated and in be, in beginning at FY25. Um, for me, I met with our Prince George's County public school system, and for them, it will take them at least 30 years to update all of their facilities. Um, these facilities cost anywhere between 2 and $5 million depending on the size, size of the school. And I met with them and they indicated that. Um, this is a longstanding issue. Um, this is something that I, I believe the state needs to invest in. Our counties currently either have to allocate the funding themselves through the, pro through the funding that we provide to them, or they have to get a bond bill from some of us in this room uh, to, in order to get their stadiums repaired. There's no source of funding for this uh, for our student athletes. We're talking about 112,000 students, um, and and this isn't a, just an issue in in my county or in Prince George's County. It's an issue in Charles County, where um, in Southern Maryland, where out of the 14 public high schools in Southern Maryland, only North Point High School has a modern field reno renovated currently. Uh, in Montgomery County, Northwood High School, Damascus High School, and recent for uh, a football champion Quince Orchard have publicly expressed the need for a new stadium, for a new stadium. Um, in Baltimore County, Woodlawn High School, Lock Raven High School, and Kenwood High School all are seeking new fields. Um, this is a longstanding issue across the state of Maryland. Um, in other states like Texas, I know Texas is big, uh, but places like Texas, they invest $72 million for one stadium. This is built, right? For one stadium. <laughs> and and we have student athletes here that deserve. I'm only we only asking for 50 million. They did 72 million for one stadium. Um, you know that's a that's a huge disparity for us as our student athletes continue to thrive and go into the professions that they that they that they um, that they're in that they want to go into. And so you'll hear today from a few of the coaches and athletic directors around the state um, I, who have expressed these concerns to me. Um, I hope the state will work to us to address this pressing need um, for the 110,000 students that we have, student athletes that we have here in the state. Um, I know this is a tough ask, uh, but I think it's a real one that our student athletes, we need to invest in them and invest in their future. And I, and I urge a favorite report for this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good. This is a, your first time in front of this committee, I think. It so is my well. first time in, this, in front of this Welcome. committee. Welcome. Nice to have oh, you here. And all y'all, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I've got questions here first. Uh, oh my gosh, let's go to Senator Jackson. We'll go to you first. Or not. Senator Benson. Yep, go ahead. You can go ahead. Oh, thank you. I, I realize the urgency of us doing something, but you know, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning utilizes many of our fields in, in, in our schools. What kind of relationship are we building with this between the school system and Maryland National Capital Park and Planning that has a boatload of money? It's the same pro that prevails in Montgomery County. I think that that even though we are very supportive of it from from Annapolis, we also need to have a sit down conversation because they have the gymnasium. They have a lot of their facilities that are connected to our elementary and middle schools. Correct. So we, we just can't leave them out of the loop. I, I would think that it would be wise for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning uh, to sit down with us to see how we can work this out in such a way that we can get this done. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And this is, this is a common complaint. Correct. I mean, and you know that just to add to it, this, these are community facilities where our communities go out there and walk, our seniors go out there and walk around those fields. And so it's it's really huge. And we met with um, the Prince George's County construction team uh, for the stadiums or athletic facilities, and they indicated they have only an MOU just to only be able to use those facilities. They don't allow the, 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 the commingling of funds from park and planning and the public school system. Uh, to be able to help with their facilities, although they do use them at times. 
Um, so they just don't. They don't allow it and they don't use it and they don't talk to one another. And so I try to urge them to do that because I wanted to not have a bill in front of you and try to find additional money that we can use. But it's not going to work. And, you know, you know, parking planning. Um, and, and oh, we got to help people. You know what I'm saying? Right. H-E-L-P. OK, thank we you. have got to help these people. That's that's a little crazy. There should be a relationship that's developed between Merle Nash Cup Park and Planning and the school system. Th that's nonsense. Isn't that, isn't that so? They need to so. sit down to see how we can work that isn't out. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? That is so. <laughs> we have four um, virtual witnesses here. If, if members of the committee, if you don't mind, I'd like to have them do their testimony and then you can ask questions. Do you mind? Just two? Okay. Um, Daryl Ferguson. Francisco Lopez. That is me. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you everyone. My name is Francisco Lopez and I'm a volunteer at Parkdale High School and I'm in support of uh, Senate Bill 818 uh, for three big reasons, health and safety, equity and revenue for our student athletes. Uh, nothing is more important than the health and safety of our players. Every year, not long after fall sports begins at Parkdale, our field quickly becomes two extremes, a hardened dirt field, dust bowl and a swamp. There are numerous holes where players have seriously injured themselves. There are metal pipes sticking out from the ground on both sides of the field, and there's no drainage system of any kind. Uh, soccer and football games can get very physical with tackles and sliding, and uh, and kids have seriously injured themselves on, 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 on these surfaces, and that includes concussions, ACL tears, amongst others. Uh, we have documented cases of injuries throughout the years because of our student athletes playing and practicing in these conditions. Um, equity. Parkdale has 20 sports and 12 of those teams are forced to share the one field space we have, which also happens to be the same field we play on. It's not fair that the other schools we have to compete against have turf and lights. With lights and a more upgraded facility, opposing teams are have uh, better capacity to practice and develop their student athletes through various weather conditions and daylight, thus giving us a disadvantage. Uh, we have numerous student athletes that don't have the chance to reach their full potential because coaches like us don't have the facility and infrastructure to properly prepare our teams. It's not fair that this will hinder their opportunities to enhance their craft and their game and take it to the college level. Revenue, having turf and an upgraded facility will mean that even in the event of rain and weather conditions, we will not have to cancel our games or move, to op to, or, or move it to the opposition's field. We'll be able to draw in revenue and ticket sales and concessions to further fundraise for our programs and our student athletes and keep money home. Uh, every season we lose opportunities to raise funds for our student athletes because we have to move our games because of <laughs> Um, an, you, up, an upgrade to the field would not only be an investment for our athletic teams, but in Parkdale itself for many years to come. Thank you. Okay, I have William Sama next on the list here. Yes. Oh, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. All right. So um, I'm the head coach of Parkdale High School, I wear, and I work close with Coach Paco. I would like for you guys to just reference to um, his testimony. If you look, um, and what you have in front of you, you will see pictures of the conditions. I just want you guys to take some time, you know, to have a visual input of what we're saying. And just so that you guys can sort of absorb what these uh, conditions or the sort of conditions these kids have to go through. Um, we currently also have all our boys, over 50 of them, both JV and varsity, um, watching this live stream, hoping and hoping that they can, you know, be able to have that uh, even playing field. Um, a lot of great kids, 3.0 and above students. Um, and so Coach Park and I are equally, um, I just don't want to belabor all the points that he's mentioned, but you know, we've really got to even, uh, even the playing field. Also, um, we're products of our county, Prince George's County. We, you know, middle school, high school, college around here, and we're just back giving back. We all have, you know, well paying jobs, but we just want to give back to these kids to help them. So we, we really do reckon on each and every one of you guys to, you know, just, uh, you know, try to even the playing field, right? Um, we've had a lot of injuries, you know, the systems, we've had teams come and we can't even start games just simply because the, they, they don't want to play in those hard conditions. So please just take some time, my remaining 39 plus or minus seconds, and just go through that um, document in front of you and look at all the conditions of our field right now. Um, and, and just try to absorb that, absorb that a little bit, please. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks for taking the time to do this. Okay. Do you wanna do this now or do you wanna do it after the rest of the witnesses? It's up to you. Okay. Uh, Daryl Ferguson. Can you hear me? Mr. Ferguson? No, he's not on as Dwayne Ferguson, the son. Well, I can see him. Yeah, we can definitely see him. Mr. Ferguson, can you hear us? We can't hear you. You might be on mute. Hello? Now we can hear you. So, so that was my brother you was calling. He's not on the call. He had to work. Um, okay. So uh, my name is uh, Coach Dwayne Ferguson from Duval High School. Um, thank you. First, thank you for letting me speak. Um, the conditions that on I feel is pretty bad. I mean, from bleachers to scoreboard to the playing field. Um, it's, the county is, is dragging their feet, it seems like to me. It, sh it should be no way we, it's five schools without turf or the school board doesn't work or we have to play on turf field because we can't play on the high field. It's just, it's just ridiculous to me. And it, it seems like they pick and choose who, who they want to give the turf to. I'm, I'm uh, the uh, current regional champion and we have a terrible stadium from the track to the bleachers. I, I, our parents come, they stand up because they don't want to sit on the bleachers. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for taking time to do Ma this. Madam Chair, can I clarify something that sure, somebody man. said about uh, turf fields? This doesn't require turf fields. It says that we want to just fund the, the stadiums themselves. This local yes. school will decide what they, what they want to do. Give the kids a fair place to play. Correct. A, a fair place, yes. Yeah. Okay, we have some committee questions. Go ahead, Senator Jackson, you've been waiting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for bringing this uh, to our attention. Um, you know, as we're walking down uh, our challenges in our school system, we've talked about this for years. We've had you know, uh, three years ago, we did the P3, we we're on the house side. You know, we did the uh, P3 program, which helps with our facilities. We have to step it up. So I, I commend you. Uh, you know, we're going to give you a pass for coming in for 50 million on your first, <laughs> your first visit. Go big or go home, uh, right? That's uh, right. I, I, and, and that's a good thing. But I, I think uh, it's great to put it back in front of us. And I will say this, uh, Senator, that, uh, you know, we do have plans in the Prince George delegation to get our parking planning folks up here before. So one of our costs awesome. meeting and uh, but this is something that we need to pay attention to and, and stop skirting the issue. Uh, our facilities are atrocious and they're not, you know, it's like we talk about making sure the school building. Or, or the school is conducive to learning. And it's the same thing should be for, for the athletics. And last thing I'll say about the F, you know, for those of us who uh, were or are uh, athletes, uh, I will say this, it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's right in front of us how great an athlete uh, track star you were because you actually sponsored a bill as a house member and a Senate member. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> You know, I'll say I'll say to this. Uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, I was pretty fast, man. I ran a four 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 forty, by the way, four three forty. Excuse me. Um, I don't hate over there. Hey, I, I would just I would just add that you know the P three. I'm glad you brought that up because those only funded elementary schools and middle schools. And not our high schools where we know that the, where the need is right now. And um, and so I'm hopeful that, you know, this will help provide some impetus and uh, to um, to our student athletes to be able to be really successful in our schools. So thank you for that question. OK, anybody else? Oh, Senator Zucker, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, great job in testifying the. Uh, um, I guess. Um, we based on you know your testimony so right now you have um you have some sense of some of the schools but we don't have a statewide you when you were when you were working on this bill in your communication do you have in your possession like a statewide need uh, i don't think there was ever one done okay so i don't I, so i don't i don't know i know for prince george's county we have a, a need of about 23 high schools or schools that need to be upgraded. Yeah. And I, it, I think I made that number for Charles County, for Charles County in Southern Maryland. Um, I guess it's 13 of their schools need to be uh, renovated. 
Yeah. And I, um, I certainly would have been surprised if you had that, right? Because it, I, I just, I didn't know. And cause I know you do great leg work and everything. So I just didn't know if, if, yeah. so I, anyway, I, let's talk offline. And cause I think it's important for the committee to have a full scale understanding of sort of what the statewide need is. Um, and that what we have a full picture yeah. of everything, but thanks. And I, and I would just add that this is, this is statewide. This is not just for Prince George's yeah. County, right? This is right. statewide. This is statewide. And this is for all of our students throughout the state of Maryland, no matter where you live or what zip code you live in. Senator Quarterman. Thank you. And thank you, Senator, for bringing the bill. Uh, nice to see someone else with an appreciation for stadiums and uh, <laughs> athletic facilities here. You almost um, added a minute to your bill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the bill talks about having the IEC involved in it. I think I already know the answer to this from kind of what you said before. Just want to be clear for the record. The IEC, there, there is no anything for facilities per, per se as far as that. Like it's all just school construction, right? That Correct. Would, this would just be a new branch kind of within that within that group, so to speak, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Yep. That's what I thought. That's Thank right. you. Anybody else? Okay, we're good. Thank you very much. It's 50 million. That's it. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank Jump you, Jump change. Appreciate it.